Morning, everybody. It's just gone 10 o'clock. <coughs> um, it's good to see um, some new faces before us this morning, and welcome. Uh, I'd like to also welcome our Cabinet Member for Children and Young People, Richard John. You're, you're always welcome at this committee. Thank you. Um, and uh, normally, we start our meetings by introducing ourselves uh, and I would invite everybody that's here this morning to be able to do that. Uh, and the way you do it, we'll just go round the room, and when it's your turn, you press the big button at the, the bottom of the mic in front of you, and if you're looking at the screen, you suddenly appear in full Technicolor, because um, our meetings are live-streamed. Uh, at the last uh, viewing, we had an audience of going on for three million, um, or was that three? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but we are live-streamed, and certainly uh, representatives of Welsh Government, Welsh Audit Office, and so on, might well be watching our deliberations this morning. So uh, there is no intimidation, and we certainly won't be following, following you home saying, we know where you live. But if you would just introduce yourself as a parent, a governor, or, or what, whatever reason you're here, uh, and you're all very welcome. Um, we do have uh, additional members of the County Council here today who aren't members of this committee. And so before we kick off, if I could just go through the way in which I would plan to handle the agenda this morning. Uh, there are clearly the technical bits about apologies of members of the committee who couldn't make it, uh, and then declarations of interest that members of the committee have to make uh, just so we are squeaky clean, so that if anybody has a connection with a school, for example, when it's declarations of interest, they would say that. Uh, and certainly, in that we're talking about some specific schools this morning, I would expect some declarations of interest. We'll then move on to the reason why several of you are here today, uh, and that's to look at the catchment area consultation. Now, I'm going to break with tradition here because uh, it can be pretty intimidating being in this room. Uh, I appreciate that. I remember the first time I spoke in here and I'd uh, gone through an election to get here. Um, but uh, when we come to talk uh, on agenda item three about admissions policy and catchment areas, uh, I know we have got uh, at least one parent here, and I will ask parents to speak first so that they don't have to sit all through the rest of elected members before they get their, their say. So just to warn you, if you're here to speak about the catchment area consultation, when we get to that agenda item, I will ask for parents that are present if they would like to speak first. There is absolutely no need to come down to the podium. You can stay where you are, because when you press the little button to speak on the microphone, the camera will hone in on you, just as it is now honed in on me, uh, and the camera will, will follow the, 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 the microphone that is turned on. So you can speak from where you're sat. Uh, I will then ask members of the committee if they would like to speak, uh, and then any other elected members if they would like to speak, and then throw it open to anybody else that's here, union reps, for example. When we come to uh, agenda item four, which is the future of Mountain House, um, and I should have said this for item three as well. I will ask officers to introduce before we get into general discussion. That having been done, members of the committee will uh, make uh, their comments first, followed by other elected members who have turned up today, followed by other speakers who have come specifically to speak on that item. In both cases, once we have heard all the representations, we will pull that together, and the process is then that our deliberations this morning are added to the existing consultation documents, 
and will go on to committee, where obviously Councillor John will have uh, uh, some important decisions to make, along with other Cabinet colleagues, in terms of both of those major agenda items we're looking at this morning. Is that clear? Amazing. Um, <laughs> If we can then start the meeting by, uh, by just introducing ourselves. My name is Martin Grokert. Uh, I'm an elected member from the Lansdowne Ward in Abergavenny and, and I chair the Children and Young People's Committee. Uh, Councillor Laurie Jones, um, elected member for Wysham and deputy chair of this committee. Richard John, County Councillor for Mitchell Troy and Cabinet Member for Children and Young People. Wendy Barnard, Democratic Services Officer. Sorry, Will. Will McLean, Chief Officer, Children and Young People, Monmouthshire County Council. Matt Jones, Manager of the School and Student Access Unit. Yeah. Um, Leanne Wakeley, the Chair of the Monmouthshire Association of School Governors. Mike Powell, apparent governor representative and member of this committee. Councillor Maureen Powell, councillor for Castle Ward and Abergavenny and a member of this committee. Kate Southland, parent of children based at Killeen County School and Goldshire Fallow Primary School, who wants to speak on agenda items three. Jason Southland, parent, same issues. Uh, Kate Parry, also parent of a child at Clean Comprehensive and a child at Usk Primary, who would also like to speak on agenda item three. Boradar, Davy Jones, a member for the Criconi Ward in North Monoshire and also a member of this committee. Boradar, good morning. Tudor Thomas, I'm an elected member for Priory Ward in Abergavenny and a member of this committee. Councillor Louise Brown, a uh, Sean Newton Ward and a member of this committee. Pete Strong from the National Education Union and a member of the committee. <coughs> Zoe Ellsmore, NASUWT. Gaynor Ball, parent of two children at Leicester Church in Wales School, and I would like to speak on agenda item three. I'm Jane Stratizard. Um, I currently have a child in year six um, at US Primary who's affected potentially by the consultation changes. Thank you. Councillor Jones, I'm Chair of Governors at Mountain House School. <coughs> Councillor Paul Pavia, um, Councillor for Larkfield Ward in Chepstow and an observer for this committee. Councillor Val Smith, Lambadic Ward observing. Um, Councillor Tony has never visited this committee today, but a mouthful, I'm also governor of two schools in Caldicott and I'm a member of MASC and I'm MASC's representative on the Health and Safety Committee. Nikki Wellington, Finance Manager for Children and Young People. Jacqueline Elias, Principal Officer for Additional Learning Needs. Um, thank you all very much. As I said right at the start, it's almost a full house today. Uh, a few people here who I wasn't expecting, but nonetheless, you are welcome. Um, in the, the, because this is a special meeting of the Children and Young People Committee, uh, our agenda is slightly different to normal. Uh, members of the committee will note, for example, that there are no minutes, and that's because it is a special meeting. Uh, and um, we are not, I think, as hidebound by rules as we might normally be. Uh, and I think, in, um, in deference to open democracy, um, whereas normally we would only allow one person representing an organisation or a place to speak. Uh, it is clear that this morning we have uh, two or three people coming from a single place and would no doubt not have been aware of that. Now I'm in a difficult position here because I have already said to Mountain House for example that I would only want one person to come to speak uh, and um, 
but in that that is the head and also the chair of governors, I would be shocked if they're not able to fully represent all the views of all their staff. We also have union rep here. And, and so, uh, although I have said I only wanted one person to speak, the way it will pan out, hopefully, we can uh, be perhaps more generous. But I would, I would hate that members of the public with a direct interest have turned up this morning unaware of that rule and for me to sit here as chair and say, I'm sorry you've come all this way, but I'm not going to let you speak. Uh, and so I will let everyone who is here today with something to add make that contribution. I will say, however, that it is the normal council practice that there will be a maximum of five minutes. And I will be ruthless in stopping people, if necessary, at the end of five minutes. Um, so if, if we are all clear on that and we all agree on that, uh, and uh, I hope we will, then that is how I will proceed this morning. So everybody will get a chance to have their say. I would plead with you, all people here, that if a point has been made already, it's not just simply repeated so you can have your say. The way this will go forward is that all points that have been made will be recorded and passed on for consideration at Cabinet. We can draw conclusions as a committee, but only committee members can vote on that. But I would like to be able to say, on behalf of everybody here today, that we will encompass the points that have been made and we will send them forward. But I would not like to hear, for example, the phrase, I agree with so-and-so, because that means the point has already been made. Uh, allowing everybody who wants to speak to speak will make this a fairly lengthy meeting. Um, and to put it bluntly, both the Chief Officer and I have meetings elsewhere in South Wales after lunch. So we need to be away. I shall be as ruthless as necessary. That said, uh, if we can move on to the agenda, uh, and could I ask if we've got any apologies for absence? Thank you. Good morning. Um, there's apologies for absence from County Councillors uh, Malcolm Lane, Joe Watkins and Sheila Woodhouse, and also from Faye Middleton from the NAS UWT. Could I now ask if any elected members have any declarations of interest? Or any members of this committee? Councillor Pavia? Uh, obviously, I'm here as an observer this morning, Chair, but just to say I'm Chair of Governors at St Mary's uh, Roman Catholic Primary School in Chapstow, uh, in the, obviously, it's part of the Chapstow cluster of schools. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Brown? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got some interest in this matter because it's in my ward, but, um, you know, I don't know any um, pupils or any, anybody else that goes there, so there's no declaration of interest needed from that point of view. Thank you. That's, that's fine. Councillor Smith? <laughs> Purely being right and proper, I have grandchildren attending uh, Goitavar Primary School. And I'm sure you're proud of all of them. <laughs> uh, Mr Fowler? Um, just that uh, I'm obviously a chair of governors at one of the schools within the Monmouth cluster, so, um, but no specific. And Ms Wakeley? Um, I'm the chair of governors at Trellick Primary School, which is part of the catchment, um, the, the agenda item three. Councillor Eason? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Being to declare an interest on governor's positions, I'm a governor on du at Dewstow and at the Finn. Uh, I won't be make, taking any part in voting this morning. Councillor Powell. I wasn't sure, but I think I better declare an interest. I'm a governor at King Henry, which is <coughs> of the same cluster as Goitra. Okay, so there we are. Let's get on to the meat of the. Oh, sorry, Councillor Thomas. Yeah, I, I did put my hand up earlier on. Um, just declaring interest, I don't think it has any material effect, but uh, I'm on the governing body of Ysgol Gymraeg in, uh, in Abergavenny. My apologies, uh, and Councillor Jones. Uh, similar position, I'm a governor at a school of Gavenny and Clanby Angler Crocone School as well. Okay, so quite a few uh, 
declarations there. Let's get on with the meat of the agenda. And item three uh, is to uh, consider the proposed revisions in catchment area. As I said, when I was trying to lay out some very basic rules for conducting the meeting, I'd like to invite parents from the schools concerned to uh, make their input now. And in that uh, parents from USC uh, contacted us first, let's kick off with USC. Thank you for letting me speak here today. Firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Gaynor Bull, and I have lived here in Esktown for the past 15 years with my husband, Chris, and our two children, Charlie, aged 11, and Darcy, aged 8. I speak here today on behalf of many parents who have children at Esk Church in Wales School and wholeheartedly support the proposed amendment of the secondary school catchment area to form part of the greater catchment area for Monmouth Comprehensive School. We believe as we live in Monmouthshire and pay our council tax to fund education that our children should have a greater chance of attending their nearest Monmouthshire comprehensive, which currently is not the case. As I mentioned earlier, my 11-year-old son Charlie and his closest friends under the current catchment area provision will now be split up when they transition to secondary school this coming September, due to our location and the lack of a designated Monmouthshire secondary school. As a very concerned group of parents, we know that these, six, these year six pupils have been offered secondary school places at three different schools across our county and further afield, namely Killian, Chepstow, Monmouth and Abergavenny. Please, I ask of you, how can that be good for the well-being and welfare of these young children to be separated from their friends? As your own consultation paperwork clearly states, to enable the cohorts of children to remain together when entering into that daunting transition between primary and secondary school. As a result of our own current catchment situation, but similar to so many other parents who sought Monmouth Comprehensive as their first choice of secondary school, we are now having to face the school's appeals process in order to try and get our children what they chose and deserve, an education at Monmouth Comprehensive School. As you can imagine and understand, the appeals process is extremely stressful for parents but more so for the children involved. The children have the opportunity to visit on open, days, on open days, feeling inspired and excited and what they, at what they saw and heard and made a choice it was the right school for them. Now, as their friends are receiving welcoming letters from the school in preparation for their transition, the children and families going through the appeals process are facing uncertainty as to which school they will attend and if they will be with their friends. As you can understand, this should be an exciting time for these children, but instead they are filled with worry and dread. So in conclusion, I ask of you, whilst you discuss the consultation, that you keep the well-being of the children, particularly in ESC, in your mind at all times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any other parents from USC? Yeah, Hello. okay, over to you. Oh, sorry. Oh. Right. Um, okay, down here, for, uh, simply because I saw the hand here. Yep, no problem. And then over to you. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you about how the proposed changes will affect our family. Uh, so we live in Gwahelog, uh, where my husband grew up. He was also um, a pupil at Killian, as were many of his um, family who live in the same area with successful outcomes. Uh, currently, we have a child who's just entered Killian in year seven last September. 
Uh, we also have um, a child who's at USK um, who will be looking um, hopefully to go to Killian as well um, because our elder child has settled in so well there. Um, he's so happy, he's thriving. We attended a parents' evening recently which was held on the same evening as the public meeting at USK Primary on this consultation. We received absolutely excellent reports so we're, we're absolutely thrilled with the education that he's received and we would like his sibling more than likely to attend the same school as her older brother. We help, think that would help with her transition. Under these proposals, obviously, uh, Monmouth will become our catchment um, school, so um, that may not be possible. Uh, perhaps we may be able to obtain a place at Culliam for her based on the fact that she's already got a sibling there. That's by no means guaranteed because Culliam is obviously an oversubscribed popular school as well. Um, the problem we do have, even if we can obtain a place for her at Killian, is that we won't be entitled to the home to school transport because Killian is not our closest school. Monmouth Comprehensive would be our closest school and so we wouldn't have that transport. Um, so we'd either have to pay for that ourselves or send her to Monmouth away from her sibling anyway. The other problem that I am concerned about is the fragmentation of her um, group of friends and uh, obviously this is a concern for many of us. Currently uh, two of her close group of friends are in the Killian catchment and would go into the King Henry catchment under these proposals. She also has friends who are currently in different catchments, Chepstow, Pontypool, um, out of those who will, like her, go from Killian to a Monmouth catchment, I know that at least one of those will still try to obtain a place at Killian simply due to the proximity of Killian and its reputation. Um, so obviously um, some parents who live in uh, Langibby will find that Killian is um, still a much more convenient school for them and will try to obtain a place there. Um, so I am concerned about the fragmentation of, of her peer group as well. I don't think these proposals are going to address that problem, which I appreciate is a problem now, having seen um, some fragmentation with my older child already having moved up to secondary school. It is a problem. These proposals don't make it any less of a problem. Um, personally, I think the problem here is with the oversubscription criteria. Um, so with Monmouth being so far to the east of the county, it means that even parents who live within Monmouthshire and very close to the catchment boundary, which we are, we can see the catchment boundary from our kitchen window between Monmouth catchment and Killian catchment, we have less of a chance of obtaining a place at Monmouth because um, than children who are living in the Forest of Dean or Herefordshire because of the position of Monmouth Comprehensive in the far east of the, the county. So I think on, on distance from school, we're obviously disadvantaged because we're further away than children who live across the border. So I think it, it would be a better way to address this problem would be to change your oversubscription criteria so that priority is given to Monmouthshire children for whom Monmouth Comprehensive is their closest Monmouthshire school. And that would deal with the problem of children in USK who would like to attend a Monmouthshire school. I totally appreciate why that is the case. And that would deal with the problem rather than necessarily changing these catchment boundaries in such a, a rushed fashion. Killian has been the catchment Could I just interrupt to say time. you've got 30 seconds left. That's fine, yeah, finished almost. Um, the, Killian has been the catchment school I know for at least since the mid-1980s when my husband and his sister attended. And to change that in such a quick fashion I think is unfair it should be coming into effect for children that start reception or apply for reception this year coming, then people can make choices about which primary to go to. Okay, thank you very much indeed. A brilliant timing, if I can say so. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my apologies, uh, a third speaker uh, uh, around issues at, at USK. 
Oh, hello. Um, I have very little to say because we only thought one person was speaking today. So again, has expressed a lot of our views. Um, but I did want to say that from attending the um, the, com the, the consultation meetings at the school, we're very aware of the um, and appreciative of the views and concerns of parents with children currently attending uh, Killian who have younger siblings. Um, likewise, if these catchment changes do go ahead, um, there's lots of families that do have younger siblings um, that will be attending Mom this year, and our children currently will be attending potentially um, a Killian or a different comprehensive because that's that's how it is at the moment. Um, just as an interesting point, a conversation last night um, we had with a friend who currently has a daughter um, attending um, Monmouth Comprehensive and it's to do really with the cluster of primary schools and um, she was very noticed or you know very observant of the fact that in terms of the Welsh studies that they are um, undertaking at Monmouth Comprehensive that a lot of the children that are attending there <coughs> from English um, primary schools who have had a kind of English curriculum they've not had Welsh language experience before or some of the other studies and they um, in terms of their classmates are, are not very appreciative of the Welsh language they're not interested in learning it and it has a knock-on she felt it had a very knock-on effect for the the children that had come up through a Welsh kind of um, primary school curriculum that these other children were, were not as interested and, and and simply because they've not had that background so I'm, I'm just putting that as a point of view as a parent that um, who has a child currently there that that you know, if more children were able to attend from the Welsh primary schools such as ASK, um, that would, you know, improve that situation potentially. And I agree also that um, if the oversubscription criteria is, is massively important here, um, that, you know, if we were further up the list of, of criteria, it would greatly benefit the children in ASK um, currently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other representation around ASK? Chair, to Chair, I've got um, an email from a parent at uh, Usk Primary School, so I don't right. know whether, oh, okay. whether I yep. can read that out but not affect my five minutes as a parent of Goitra School. I hope it's not a very long email. It's, it's if you, while you've got the mic, read the mic about Usk. So, sorry, uh, Mr McLean. Sorry, Chair. We've undertaken a full um, and complete consultation exercise with an open opportunity for everybody to respond online, through the uh, surveys, through the meetings and so on. I'm not entirely comfortable with bringing in other people's views beyond your own into this setting to capture it outside of the full and formal consultation exercise. Your constitution does say, though, that the chair of this <coughs> committee will take into account all of public views on the matters raised. And this is something that this parent does want to want to bring to this committee's attention. It's just that she couldn't be here today because she has to, she's in work. Yeah, I, I, um, I have to say, I, 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 I take the chief officer's point. Um, do, do we know if the person who sent the email has been able to add to the consultation exercise so far? I believe she has responded to the consultation exercise, but I do believe these are issues that she does want to bring to this committee's attention. I, I, I'm afraid I would have to say that <laughs> This is not the public consultation. This, this is parents trying to have their say to a select committee that will then make a decision on its view uh, to go forward. If, if the chance has already been taken to make a point, then that chance uh, was there. So I would ask you, I think, on reflection uh, and on the advice of the chief officer uh, to confine your remarks just to goitre. Okay, so you've got a, a maximum of five minutes. Chair, thank you very much for letting me speak at this special meeting of the Children and Young Persons Select Committee. I'm a resident of Monkswood and the parent of children who attend both Killian School and Goitra Fawa Primary School. The following points have caused some concern for parents in Goitra, the surrounding areas and us, and those largely revolve around the consultation process. We can all agree that these proposals have serious implications for children and parents and for the education of children living in the affected area. <laughs> to grasp a firm picture of how the proposals will impact on children, parents have had to read at least six documents. I'm aware that the local education authority has had a time frame to work to. But why, given the significance of the changes proposed, has a consultation run for a bare minimum of six weeks, the 18th of January to the 1st of March, when the council could have afforded parents a longer and greater opportunity to consider the detailed proposals. 
The consultation comprised a number of evening events at primary schools. The event at Goitra Far Primary School was held on the 5th of February. This was on the same evening as parents' evening at Killian Comprehensive School. The event at US Primary School was held on the 20th of February. Again, this was on the same evening as a Year 6 Moving Up meeting at Killian Comprehensive School. Parents of children starting at Com Killian Comprehensive School and those of children already at the Comprehensive School um, were more likely to give negative feedback to the proposals. They were prejudiced in their ability to attend the events and provide views. It also seems to parents that different information was given at different meetings. I attended the meeting here at County Hall, as I was unable to attend the meeting at Goitra Far Primary School. I came away from the meeting at County Hall quite positively, understanding that all options were on the table and a dual catchment that would be something that would be seriously considered. Discussing this with parents who attended at other events, it was clear that their impression, rightly or wrongly, was that this council considered that a dual catchment was not an option, and that was just one example. It seems that different information has been given to different parents at different times. Taking the length of time given to parents to review the information, the inability of those parents more likely to be critical of the proposals to attend the meetings, and the inconsistent information given, does the Council really think that on balance this demonstrates a fair consultation procedure? Additionally, there has been some concern in the local community about the composition of the Cabinet taking the decision matter in relation to code of conduct matters, namely personal and prejudicial interests of members. Clearly, the Monmouthshire County Council Code of Conduct applies to all members of the Council. The declaration of personal and prejudicial interests is a matter personal to those elected members who will attend the Cabinet meeting when the decision is made. But members of this meeting should be aware that the issue of personal and prejudicial interest continues to cause a great deal of concern to parents in the local community. In relation to the policy itself, I understand the bigger picture of Monmouthshire Council's aim to ensure that children in Monmouthshire are educated at Monmouthshire schools. However, the proposals in their current form haven't thought through all of the implications for children and parents within the affected areas. The proposals as they stand are unfair. I will offer you one example, my own personal example, of the, that unfairness. I have two children. My eldest child is already at Killian School. My youngest child will be in the group of children affected by this policy. My youngest will not be in catchment for Killian School, but instead will be in catchment for King Henry VIII. My preference is for both my children to attend the same school. They've attended the same primary school and have had a good positive shared experience of primary education. I believe that a shared educational experience is of immense importance to my family. Traditionally, children do attend the same school. I attended the same school as my siblings. My husband attended the same school as his siblings. Recollections of those experiences still exist today. One of your committee members was a shared teacher, one of our most inspirational teachers that we had, and his history lessons are still recalled by us as a family today. <coughs> Attendance at the same school gives siblings a shared experience and fosters the same outlook on life. Our youngest child will positively benefit from the established relationship between our family and the school. Indeed, there's already a sense of belonging with the school, having attended event events Could I and being involved say you have in discussions seconds left. about school life. Our home is also closer to Killian than King Henry VIII. <coughs> I'm sure that there will be some that will say there will be nothing to stop me from applying for a place at Killian School. However, in the event of oversubscription, I'm not guaranteed a place. In fact, to the contrary, I'm unlikely to secure a place at Killian for my youngest child. Chair, I would simply ask that the members consider carefully before any decisions are made whether the proposed policies can Thank be you, approved upon to provide a fairer system a for all before they are implemented. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, Goitra? Yes, I'm from Goitra. Um, I'm Jason Southern. Uh, I live in Monkswood and have children in Killian and in um, Goitra Farrow Primary School. I just wanted to bring up some of the issues on the consultation process itself. Um, it just, it, there's two processes. A, you did the consultation, which you're obtaining qualitative data, um, that is people's views that are unrestricted. Um, however, you've got to also consider that you approached people and told them that, they, that the people who attended them were mainly those who would be affected. Um, and so therefore, if it did clash with venues, then obviously the, the, the data and the samples that you're getting the information is going to be skewed in a certain way. 
Furthermore, I wanted to ask whether Monmouthshire County Council actually considered why they use SurveyMonkey. Um, SurveyMonkey, um, that with your online tests, is not used in most of the educational establishments in the UK because it doesn't conform to GDPR. Um, do you know where the data is held? Did you know that SurveyMonkey is held in America? Your data and the comments that you made are not held in this country. Furthermore, um, there was no retention policy when you actually filled in the documentation on your online survey. Um, how long do you intend to keep it for? Also, looking at the online survey, you actually asked for, um, it, but it was optional, um, you asked for email addresses and addresses, personal addresses of those people. Again, where are they stored? Why did you need them? Um, in the actual survey itself, and it, it's, it's, uh, your online survey is quantitative, sorry, quantitative, which means it's a, a lot of data um, or, or simply a tick spot exercise. However, you, de you required to complete the survey a postcode. So why was that required? Was that to actually date the sift or date the sort information? And again, I just asked that question. It needed to be looked at. The question then I would ask is, if, if an online survey was a link, could be open to abuse on both sides? Because anybody could go onto it, whereas your quality data from your meetings were mainly from people who were actually or directly affected from it. So therefore you've got to be careful with the data sets that you're looking at and who is actually looking at it. So the question I want is, is, is just say, you put on there the online process um, that was unrestricted in theory um, and the quality of data from your meetings was technically restricted on the sample size because it was only by the people who were directly affected who would turn up. Um, so all I just wanted to say is, had any consideration been taken into that? Because if not, GDPR is real and you need to ask some questions about that because it is not used. We cannot use it in any higher educational establishment because of that? Was that at all considered when you did survey monkey? And therefore, where is this data? Where is our data held? Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other parents? Uh, May I have one please? Uh, I will give you 30 seconds. Um, I would just say on the benefit of the online survey, on the morning that the catchment area or the, the schools came out, my son found that he didn't get into Monmouth this year. Out of eight friends, they were split over four schools, as Gaynor said, and he knew I'd been to the meetings and he, we've been dis discussing it in the family. And he said, what can I do, Mum, because I don't want other children to go through this upset. He was so upset. And so he actually went onto the online survey himself and he wrote how he felt about the process because it's directly affecting him. So I just wanted to say... In, he couldn't attend the meetings, they were in the evening, um, but in terms of the online survey, a child that says children can, can comment on there, he did put in on that morning to express how it affects him as a young person, which at the end of the day, that's, that's okay. what this is all about. Thank Th you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, could I thank you all? Uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to address a public meeting, especially when the chair has told you that it's been live streamed. So uh, my congratulations on the <coughs> lucidity that you have shown in putting your case. Uh, what I'd like to do now is to revert to almost uh, something rather more akin to our normal practice and invite our chief officer to introduce his comments and then the committee to take the matter forward from there. But you're more than welcome to stay and listen to our deliberations as members of the public. Uh, over to you, Mr. McLean. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. Um, I just, I'll offer a few comments around the, the critique of the uh, engagement and consultation exercise, but then my colleague, uh, Matthew, will uh, take you through the actual proposals um, and where we've arrived following the consultation process to help us advise Cabinet members. And I think that's a really, really fundamental point we must look at in the very first instance. So this was not a predetermined um, decision. Um, we clearly set out our aspirations that we educate Monmouthshire children in Monmouthshire. Um, but we wanted to take the views of all of those affected. And we set out about doing that 
in an open and transparent way using a, a, a range of different opportunities and channels. Um, we did have some evening meetings that were publicised well in advance. We also had alternative meetings during the day for those people who couldn't make the evening meetings and a full opportunity to access information uh, online and to submit data. So I think we've done that in a, a full and open way. Um, we have formed a judgment, and I'll leave uh, Matthew and Councillor John to set out their positions on that later. I think one thing that was raised whilst we were at us school um, in the consultation process was this issue around personal and prejudicial interest. Of course, um, being uh, taking the proper line and taking advice from our Section 142 monitoring officer, the legal officer of the council, we were content that there was not a personal and prejudicial interest because no part of the decision that the councillors may take would give them an advantage or a, preju or a preferential position vis-a-vis -vis any other parent in that area. And I think that's really important um, that we note that right at the outset. So there was not, um, from our legal advice's view, that personal or prejudicial interest. I do understand that this is a highly contentious issue um, and I do understand, of course, that uh, Killeen School has been uh, the catchment school for this area for a significant period of time. I think the politicians have been very clear in all of their documentation since they've arrived um, as the latest administration about the fact that they want to see Monmouthshire people and pupils educated in Monmouthshire. That's been the driving piece behind this consultation exercise. It was flagged up in the corporate plan well over a year ago and I think is part of a key pattern of ongoing engagement around some changes around education. So I don't think it should have come as a surprise necessarily to anybody that this catchment review was something that we were going to undertake. I think in terms of the, um, the GDPR issues, we, can, I, not, we won't go through those um, now this morning. We pick those up, and if we want to do that directly, then I'm happy to do that. I think in terms of the balance of qualitative and quantitative uh, information, um, the opportunity is there on the, uh, the e-forms to offer qualitative views uh, and to set out your concerns and the reasons, as well as an indicative position of whether you're in favour or against a proposal. In the same way, any engagement exercise, and having looked after the engagement processes in the authority for a long time, inevitably they are difficult to do. Inevitably there will be people who feel comfortable speaking out in a room of people and some people who won't. We have to afford as many opportunities to people to contribute their views um, through this process. And I believe that we've done that in a fair and open way. I'll conclude there and I'll pass on to Matthew and Councillor John who will uh, talk about uh, the outcomes of the consultation exercise um, and the decision that will be taken forward to Cabinet in April. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just thought I'd, um, I'd just start this feedback in terms of just summarising what the proposals were concerning this catchment review. Um, we've focused heavily on uh, two specific areas, but there were actually four areas under which we undertook a consultation. So just so that all members are aware of the full extent of the consultation, I thought I'd remind everyone of, of the full areas and the proposals. So uh, to begin with, the first review area related to ASK, which um, we've already touched upon this morning, and the proposals there were to align the catchment area for Monmouth Comprehensive School with the catchment area for ASK Primary School. The second area, again, that we've touched upon um, is concerning Goitra, and the view there was to seek um, uh, a view from consultees on aligning the uh, catchment area for Goitra Varro Primary School with uh, King Henry VIII. Proposal three was to look at aligning the um, entire catchment area for Trellick Primary School with Monmouth Comprehensive School. At the moment, the, um, the large majority of Trellick's catchment falls to Monmouth, but there's a small area that falls to Chepstow. And similarly, then, with review area four, uh, we were looking at uh, the area of Landogo 
similar situation to uh, Trellick in that it's considered to be a feeder school for, for Monmouth. The majority of its catchment area aligns to Monmouth, but there are areas that fall to Chapstone. <coughs> So the, hopefully um, everyone here today has had sight of the consultation document that was circulated to, to all affected parties. Um, but just to summarise really uh, some of the reasons why we, uh, we brought forward these proposals for consultation, and I will reiterate it was for consultation. Um, and first of all, in terms of the, the Goitra and Ask situation, um, the proposals were at large brought around um, the fact that the majority of those families did not have a designated catchment school that falls within the county of Monmouthshire. This impacts on their ability to obtain places at a Monmouthshire school and in, cert in certain circumstances where they do obtain places has led to issues around not being able to receive free home to school transport to a Monmouthshire school. For the Trellick and Landogo um, proposals, um, we have been faced over the last few years with a situation where although um, the large majority of pupils from Landogo and Trellick choose to transition to Monmouth, um, the, the catchment anomaly where, we, where they're not perfectly aligned means that some of those children have been unable to secure places alongside their peers. That's quite often resulted in, in quite a small school like Trellet, uh, like uh, Landogo, um, where you're talking one or two pupils out of the cohort that has had to go to another school because they haven't been able to access a place at Monmouth Comprehensive. Due to the current oversubscription criteria and the um, catchment arrangements. In terms of consultation, um, we um, undertook a formal consultation which started on the 18th of January. Um, we targeted all affected parties. Um, and whilst the requirements of um, the, the school admissions code do not require it, we undertook a six-week consultation with all of those in the affected areas. Um, and we also facilitated 11 public consultation sessions with a view of obtaining a view on whether the, the proposals were supported or whether there was a need for us to reflect on those proposals. And I think it's important to say that the proposals that, that were put forward were generated from feedback from those affected parties. So it, it, it's been a real opportunity for us to go out to those in the affected areas and actually see what uh, the communities feel is the most appropriate um, setup in terms of admission policy and catchment areas. So officers at the moment, on conclusion of that, that um, consultation uh, period, officers are now in the process of compiling um, the consultation report, which will be taken to Cabinet in April to help inform a decision on, on a way forward but will also be uh, publicly made available to all affected parties so they can see the outcome of, of the, uh, the consultation. In terms of how we're, form, uh, we're formulating that consultation report, um, yes, we are looking at the formal responses to uh, this consultation but we are not discarding the feedback that we've received through the public consultations either. Um, they are, the feedback that we've received has all, all been recorded within the consultation report and our answers to any questions that have been raised. And it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of both the formal responses to the consultation and the feedback from the public consultation meetings that has helped us form themes for um, how people feel about the proposals that we put forward. During the consultation process, 
um, we um, sought the views of children and young people. Um, so we, um, we visited the, um, the schools um, affected by the proposals and we asked them to complete um, a, a very quick survey really that sought the views of um, those children on, on whether they've had any thoughts about secondary school provision at this stage and um, whether if they have what those reasons were that they were um, considering a certain school. So again, the, the voice of the children and young people affected uh, within these schools has formed part of the consultation report. In general, um, the, the report sets out four individual uh, consultation responses based on four different review areas. So one of the, um, the, the directives from the cabinet member was that he very much wanted each proposal to be considered um, as an individual proposal. Um, and that's the view that will be um, taken in terms of our presentation to uh, cabinet in April. So each of the proposals will have a, a, a consultation report that analyzes the results of each individual uh, consultation proposal. In general, the feedback from the consultation sessions and the um, the formal responses to each of the proposals would suggest that the proposals that we have put forward um, achieved a majority support in the, in the majority. As I said, the absolute detail behind that will be shared um, into, with the consultation report. Um, on each individual proposal, but the general consensus is that for the, the four proposed areas, it was generally supported. And the view of the children and young people that we consulted with was that our, our proposals to amend the catchment area schools reflected their preference for the school that they wanted to go to in general. Whilst I've mentioned that there's a, a general support, of course there were some themes of, of concern that were coming through from the, uh, the consultation. And the authorities had a duty to consider those themes of concern in forming uh, the outcome of the consultation report and any report that goes to cabinet. I think we've discussed um, a large number of them this morning through the feedback from parents, um, but general themes of concern, and I will stipulate that these are general and, and are more detailed within the consultation report. Um, around the Esk and uh, Mama, sorry, the Esk and Goitra proposals, um, a real concern around risk of splitting sibling groups. Um, a concern around um, a potential increase in travelling times to the schools that we were proposing. Um, there was a concern around uh, capacity issues at um, Monmouth Comprehensive School, which has already been uh, known to be oversubscribed, and whether our proposals can accommodate, um, our current situation can accommodate the proposals. And there was a, a general view um, around standards of education between the, the schools that we were offering. So that the um, officers have put, put together uh, some thoughts around if proposals are taken forward to cabinet in terms of a recommendation of, of proceeding, um, how we can mitigate those um, themes of concern. One of the interesting things that came back to us through uh, the consultation was um, our, our discussions um, and formal consultation with Newport Local Authority. 
Uh, Newport Local Authority are the admission authority for uh, Killian Comprehensive School and therefore formed um, a, a, an important consulty for us when we were putting forward these concerns or these, um, these proposals as part of the consultation. Their response to us has been overwhelmingly supportive um, in terms of the overarching principles around what we were trying to do. Um, and um, that they have is issues within their own authority that they feel that our proposals will support. However, what they have informed us of is that um, as, as the admission authority for Killian School, um, they are responsible for the admission arrangements. And despite our consultation with them, uh, for September uh, 2020, they have no proposals at the moment to amend Killian's catchment area. So at the moment, the, the proposals, if they are taken forward, would, would result in, in line with Newport's admission arrangements, the affected areas remaining within the catchment area for Killian School. That would differ to the admission arrangements for Monmouthshire, which would determine the affected areas to be within the catchment area for either King Henry or Monmouth. But as, as we've discussed this morning, Newport are the admission authority and they are responsible for determining um, who is awarded places at that school. So their, their, their boundary for the catchment extends into Monmouthshire. That, that would result in a, a number of the concerns that have come through around parental preference, um, a, a risk of splitting sibling groups and peer groups, actually um, being addressed through Newport's uh, continuation to uh, consider the areas to be part of the catchment area for Killian. What I would say in terms of, of, of risks and the decisions that need to be taken by Monmouthshire Council in terms of how we move forward is that because Monmouthshire Council determine uh, the affected areas to be, form part of the catchment area for Monmouthshire School, in terms of the transport arrangements, transport would be provided to the nearest or catchment school. So transportation to Killian would only be available in, in the circumstances identified to be the nearest suitable school. Transport to um, what we determine to be the catchment school, if proposals are taken forward, would be available to King Henry and Monmouth. A further risk uh, for, for consideration is that Newport have uh, indicated an intention that this may not be a long-term proposal and that they may themselves bring forward proposals to amend their catchment area in future. If they do so, it would be subject to consultation with the affected parties and couldn't be implemented prior to September 2021. I think that's all I was looking to cover in terms of the, the catchment uh, area proposals. The only other uh, area I wanted to just draw attention to, because it's already been mentioned this morning, but alongside catchment areas, we have undertaken a separate consultation in terms of the oversubscription criteria, um, and that has been um, formally circulated for, for consultation and will form part of uh, cabinet's decision as well around admission arrangements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Firstly, can I thank the parents who've come in this morning, who've spoken really articulately, and I, I don't underestimate how difficult a time um, it, it can be and the heavy responsibility that you have as a parent in terms of um, expressing a preference for, for secondary school. But I think it's a preference that as a parent you should be able to express. I know from speaking to my opposite numbers in in some other local authorities, um, there are some local authorities who take the position that you should go to your nearest school. I don't believe that child should necessarily go to their nearest school. I think as a parent, it's such an important decision 
um, selecting which school your children go to, you should be able to express a preference. Now, while no local authority would say that they have a system of completely free choice, we've been very clear as an administration that we want parents to be able to express a preference and to have as much choice as they possibly can about their school places. And at the moment, there are parts of Monmouthshire where families can't access places at their nearest Monmouthshire school. So we've been clear, certainly since we were elected in 2017, that if you live in Monmouthshire, you pay your council tax in Monmouthshire, you elect councillors in Monmouthshire to take decisions about school funding, that you should be able to send your children to a Monmouthshire school. While I appreciate that most of the towns in Monmouthshire are very close to our borders and we, we have the um, lowest transition, the lowest retention rate in terms of pupils from Monmouthshire primary schools progressing to secondary schools because we lose some children out of county. We have some children from out of county who come into our secondary schools. But we've been very clear that families who live in Monmouthshire who can hold us in this chamber to account for decisions about how much money goes to Monmouthshire schools, that they should be able to access Monmouthshire school places. Of course, while parents should still have the, the right to apply to um, schools out of county, if that's what they, they wish to do, then there's no accountability there. You can't hold councillors in um, Herefordshire or Newport to account for those decisions, whereas here you've got access to your local councillors. Um, so I, I don't underestimate how important a, a decision um, this is. Let me pick up on some of the points that have been made so far. Um, the consultation wasn't rushed. Um, we were very clear in 2017 that this is something we, we wanted to revisit. Um, we had to make a decision. Um, Welsh Government demand that we make a decision by the 15th of April. We couldn't have held the consultation any earlier because we then would have run over the Christmas holidays. I don't think it would have been appropriate to hold a consultation on something of this scale during a two-week um, Christmas holiday. Um, we held... Um, 11 public meetings across the county. I chaired 10 of those. Um, and I, I can make the point again, a dual catchment is still on the table. Um, and I've, I made that point at, at, at a number of those, those meetings. That was something that was, was asked by a number of parents. Um, the point about the parents' evenings in Killian, we set these dates in advance of the consultation starting. No one drew attention to any meetings at Killian or indeed anywhere else in advance of the public meeting. Um, had, we, had those issues been raised with us, we could have perhaps changed the date all the time. Although I do note that the parents' evening in Killian started at 3.30 and our meeting finished at 8 o'clock. Um, there are oversubscription issues at both Monmouth and Killian. Um, and one of, the, one of the things we've been looking at, of course, while Monmouth is oversubscribed, it's not oversubscribed with children from Monmouthshire. Um, and I appreciate our first uh, line of accountability is to, to people who, who reside in the county. Um, so one of the, one of the other points we've been looking at that, um, that Matt referred to is, is our admissions criteria and introducing um, a criteria for a feeder school because we recognise how important it is that peer groups can stay together. I, I, I particularly note the, um, the point about Landogo, where you might have 9, 10, 11 children in a year group, and if you're the one or two children who don't get a place in Monmouth, that's really heartbreaking, and I recognise the, the impact that could have on a child. So we want peer groups to be able to stay together, um, and we also want siblings to be able to stay together. And that's why we, we recognise the, um, in the oversubscription criteria that Newport have, the same as us, that they prioritise siblings out of catchment over um, children who get their school placed purely on a, on a distance criteria. Um, so that, that is really important for us as well. Another point that was raised during our consultation was, well, if you're changing catchment areas, why didn't you agree with Newport in advance of your consultation a set of um, criteria that would perhaps prioritise siblings out of catchment even higher up the list? Well, that would have completely prejudged our consultation. Um, you know, we, we went into this, and I said at every one of those meetings we held, that this is an open consultation. While we've put forward proposals that we think have merit, nothing is predetermined, so everything's on the table. 
Um, and it would have been really inappropriate, I think, to have um, almost bounced our consultation into a particular um, conclusion by agreeing that with, with Newport in advance. So we can never say to any parent that we can guarantee them a school place. And even if we do go ahead with these changes, we won't be able to promise any parent that they can definitely get a place at a particular school. But hopefully, with these proposals, we can give parents a degree of confidence that if they do go ahead, and I recognise that sometimes, for whatever reason, a parent may send their child to a school that isn't their catchment school, but hopefully these feeder proposals will also ensure and help to keep peer groups together if, if that's what parents want. And I, I do recognise that as a parent, this is a really emotive, really big decision for you to make. But I really do believe that as a parent, you know what is best for your child. You, you can go around the schools, you can make a really informed decision about what's best for your child's future. And that's really at the heart of these proposals. Okay. Um, just to remind members of committee, what, what has happened in the first hour of, of, of this discussion uh, is that interested parties, including our own officers, have made representations to us as a committee to help us to form our view. Um, we have heard conflicting views, but as members of this committee make their own observations, I would ask you to bear in mind the different views that you have heard put to us this morning, uh, and to give those equal weighting before you might well come to a conclusion of your own. Um, in other words, this is not an additional to the public consultation that is finished. This has been people making a case to us as elected members who will make a, a, a judgment that will go to a cabinet. It's a heady responsibility that we have this morning. Uh, and, and I have to say, it's probably the first time in my life I have had any sympathy for Theresa May. <laughs> <laughs> Not a great deal of sympathy, but some. Um, I would hope that at the end of our considerations as a committee, we might be able to send some concrete ideas of our views to Cabinet, because that is our role as scrutiny. It's our chance as backbenchers to actually have a say in this process. But the, all of the comments we've heard this morning have been to inform our discussions from now on until we end this part of the agenda. And I would ask you to bear that in mind, please. So having said that, uh, I will open up the discussion first to members of the Children and Young Persons Committee and then to other elected members who might wish to make a comment. Mr Fowler. Thank you. Um, I, I want to um, raise a point that hasn't been mentioned uh, this morning so far, um, and it's the absolute importance, and I, I, to let, to let me begin by saying I wholly support all four consultations and think it's a great idea. And the reason and rationale behind that is, as a very active member of the Monmouthshire cluster of schools, of which, ironically, USK is a member of that cluster, as it's seen to feed into Monmouth Comp, although it doesn't quite feed into Monmouth Comp, but it sits on its own currently as feeding into no Monmouthshire school. So it was lumped in with us as a cluster, and it's a very active school within our cluster of schools. Now, the... the, the the way I see it is um, there's an unprecedented agenda of change and reform in education in Wales at the moment. And that agenda has been going on for a few years now and it is now actually gaining pace and the implementation period of it is, is upon us. And that implementation is being driven by the cluster. So a lot of the initiatives, a lot of the work is being done at cluster level. Now, to have a school working within a cluster that then doesn't see its children feeding into that 
feed a comprehensive school is a nonsense. It's a mockery that these children are being um, primed, essentially, to go to Monmouth Comp, and then we send them somewhere else. And I think, really, it needs to align. And, and as all four proposals see, is that those feeder schools see the catchment areas align uh, with the cluster. And I think the, the power of the cluster is of, of utmost importance at the moment and in seeing that the initiatives for young people are seen through fruition. Ms. Wakeley. Just to add a, a very quick point to what Mike's just said. The transition, there is a, a, a statutory requirement for schools to um, manage transition arrangements between themselves, primary schools and secondary schools. And to, and, to, and to make that as, as seamless and as, and as good a process as possible. And the transition arrangements between, in the Monmouth cluster, the, the working relationships in the Monmouth cluster are very, very strong. And the transition arrangement, arrangements that they have been putting in place to, to, to ease that transition are very strong. And it's very difficult to do that. Us primary school is in a very difficult situation when they are not all um, going in, in that direction when the catchment areas aren't, aren't aligned. So it, it makes that cluster working with that, um, that is, is being, being um, pushed forward by Welsh Government um, as the way of, of strengthening schools and improving schools more difficult if, 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 if things aren't aligned. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Brown. <laughs> yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think um, obviously it is, it is a difficult I issue and um, uh, thinking back as a parent um, uh, quite a while back now, unfortunately, um, I think it is very difficult for parents if they've got children who are split between different schools, you know. I mean, it's, it's the practicality of, of uh, actually getting um, both children to school on time. And it would be helpful if um, in the... Um, mitigation things that come forward, how this this um, would be actually dealt with. And I think that would be useful, particularly bearing in mind the contributions that have been made today, you know, in a sense how that could be uh, mitigated. Um, I, di I did make a comment, although it's it's not, um, the consultation is, isn't um, in, in the Chepstow area, I did make a comment that where there were where there was um, sort of a, a borderline between Monmouth and Chepstow, um, there was actually, it was always going towards um, drawing the boundary towards Monmouth, which I, I thought was rather strange in view of the fact that Monmouth is oversubscribed and Chepstow is undersubscribed. And, and I was obviously concerned about the um, sustainability of, of Chepstow because of the fact that um, obviously, if you're, if you're talking about, um, uh, you know, for example, a comparison between Monmouth and Chepstow, they both have good results, but, um, uh, you know, Monmouth has a spanking new building, which obviously will be more attractive, and I think it's important to keep uh, Chepstow sustainable in, in the meantime. So, really, the, the uh, area I'm coming from, having listened to the people this mor morning, is about, um, you know, the, the issue of parental choice and not splitting siblings and also um you know for, for a note to be made about i know there are only small numbers because when i looked at the consultation there were small numbers and you know there, there may be some logic logic to it but i was a bit concerned where there was a borderline between the two that um uh, you know chepstow wasn't offered as an alternative as well thank you Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone that came in. I won't repeat anything that you say, you've say. you said, otherwise um, I'll get lynched <laughs> from the chair next to me. But there's a lot of what's been said already that I wanted to say today. Um, it's very emotive for me as a parent, um, with someone who would be in the situation of being affected by these proposals. But also, it's something that I'm very aware of that has been going on for decades. And for me, it's, uh, it seems to be decades of unfairness. As an USC resident and a former pupil of USC Primary School, um, I had no choice. I think the choice was taken away from me that um, a long, long time ago now. <laughs> and I was almost forced to go to Cleon. Um, it was a good school. 
Um, but I wouldn't have been able to get transport paid for to go to Monmouth if I'd wanted to go there, which I actually did. Um, and um, and our, my peer groups were obviously split up as well. Um, it's something for a long time I felt very passionate about. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's completely unfair that uh, people in... Uh, uh, residents of us, children of us, who don't have the choice. I completely understand that siblings would want to go with with their um, uh, would want to stay together and go to Killian, and um, and equally siblings would want to go to Monmouthshire Mom School together. Um, it completely makes sense to me, but I wholeheartedly support everything in these proposals because I think it takes account of of that. Um, and I think this is the, the fairest proposals that have come forward over the decades. It has been, there's not, this is not a new consultation. These consultations have been going on over the decades, but this is the fairest form I've seen. And I completely agree, agree with what's been said and would wholeheartedly support it going forward um, for all the reasons that have been outlined today. But particularly, the, I, I was um, heartened to hear about the well being of pupils. I think the well-being is, should be at the heart of everything that we think about when we're making our decisions um, at whatever level of politics, especially the well-being of our children. And I think, but I do think that these proposals, as Councillor John has outlined, um, support those. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. I, I have to say, had this meeting been a week later, you might have been speaking for your two children rather than <laughs> your one child. But, uh, yeah. I think you're doing remarkably well hanging, yeah. hanging in there. <laughs> but, uh, um, OK, moving on. <laughs> uh, Councillor Thomas. Uh, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I, I'm very grateful to the parents who've come here today. And it, and it is a very emotive subject, and particularly when, when you're talking about your own children. Um, I, I really think we're between a rock and a, and a hard place. Uh, having been in a position a long time ago, having taught in England, moved back here, one of my sons went to, through the English, as it were, system, went to King Henry VIII. My other two sons uh, went through the Welsh medium um, system. And therefore, we, we were in a position with one in, in one system, two in another. It, 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 it wasn't as bad as, as I'd in, envisaged, and it, it, you know, it, it, it is manageable. Um, and you might well say, well, yes, that, that's years ago, and I'm, I'm talking about my own son or daughter now. I've got to be absolutely honest. I, I support the proposals um, in the sense that for people who pay their council tax in Monmouthshire, they, they vote in Monmouthshire, but then their children go to Newport and go to Carleon. Um, personally, I, I, I can't say I feel happy with that. And, and all in all, we've got four very good comps in the authority. I, I would want to see children having their primary education within the authority and moving to secondary within um, the authority. Uh, I can understand the concern, and particularly with, with, with the sibling issue, but, but in the harsh reality of it, uh, this decision will have to be made at some point, and if we defer it now, and, and your children will not be affected, but then obviously in, in four years' time or five years' time, another set of children and, and, and parents will uh, be affected. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, in terms of looking at, at uh, the good for, for, for most children, I, I would have to support the, the proposals. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Uh, before I bring in Councillor Powell, I'll say that after this, in, uh, this contribution, I'll open it up to any other members who are not on the committee if they would like to uh, come in. But Councillor Powell. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> um, the, what we do I, I, in this is we work with clusters. And uh, I don't know what the other comprehensive schools do, obviously, but at King Henry, we intersperse with the primary schools some of our teachers go there on our, uh, at odd days and work with the children there, and, other, and the children are allowed to come and see what's going on in King Henry. If you've worked with the cluster and you've been going into that school and those teachers have been coming to you, it only makes sense that you're going to feel happier going to the secondary school within your cluster. And that's why I think this is um, a good idea. Are there, uh, do you want to come in there, Mr. McLean? Yeah, just, very I, just as a, a point of clarity, and Matt was feeding back, just to be really clear what the outcome um, we're proposing as a consequence of the consultation exercise, particularly with regards to the Newport position. 
The result of that outcome will mean that in terms of our admissions for Goitra, King Henry is the catchment school and for USK, Monmouth is the catchment school. For Newport, as the admitting authority, Goitra and USK would both remain in Killian's catchment area. So in essence, in substance over form, we will have for one year, and within our control, a dual catchment area. Whatever Newport determine they want to do in the future is not within our control. Clearly, when they consult on that, we will respond fully and appropriately, but it wouldn't be for our local authority to try and fetter what another local authority tries to do in terms of how it administers its schools and their admissions processes. So in essence, the point you made earlier about the dual catchment has remained on the table in an open and transparent way, and that looks as though, subject to a cabinet decision, that looks as though that will be the outcome of the proposals that officers put forward for Cabinet to consider on the 4th of April, or potentially the 3rd of April, yes. So I hope that clarifies that point and, uh, and gives clarity to, to members of the committee. Thank you very much for the clarification. Are any other members wanting to make a point? Okay, well, just to try... Oh, sorry, Miss Wakeley. I also wanted to say that I'm fully supportive of the proposals but also that um, the principle of feeder schools is, is really key to this, and I know you've, you've said that before, but is, this is the, that, that's the, the, the key thing, is that all children who are in one primary school, when the decision is made which primary school they go to, can all go to the same secondary school um, together, and that, that's the really, the really key part of that proposal, I think. Okay, well... Uh, to try to sum up, uh, it seems to me that, that uh, what the local authority is trying to do is to bring a greater rationality to the system so that Monmouthshire children can go to Monmouthshire schools and that our four comprehensive schools heading up their clusters would know which schools and which children would be feeding into them, subject to a uh, parental wish, of course. It's interesting that as the consultation has developed, the idea of a dual catchment area for the, the time being, until Newport might issue uh, a, a new policy, uh, is very much on the table. Uh, and I hope that you think that is a, a reasonable summary of why the consultation has been brought forward and what its outcomes in a nutshell would be. As a committee, I think it is right and proper that we express a view. From the chair, I'm going to try to put forward <coughs> an idea and, and of course we now have this new idea in, in politics of the indicative vote which I had never heard of until last week. But let's take this as the first indicative vote, and if this is turned down, somebody can be brave enough to try to find another resolution to go to Cabinet. But from the Chair, I would suggest that this committee uh, fully supports the concept that Monmouthshire children should be educated in Monmouthshire schools, that our uh, catchment areas line up with our cluster areas and that wherever possible uh, friends from key stage two should not be separated on going to key stage three and that we note and support that for the immediate there will be a dual catchment for Killian Comprehensive School. If you would support that could you please show your hand. Uh, yeah, uh, Sorry, Councillor I, Brown would like to, a, uh, a small amendment. Yeah, I mean, the only amendment would be to um, 
you know, in future reviews of, of catchments to keep an eye on the position of, of Chepstow because I, you know, as I've made that, that remark, I'm not saying in relation to this because obviously we're just um, concerned with small numbers, but, you know, I, d I do want to obviously um, just add that, that little note, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm happy to add that. And, and Mr. Strong, and this is going to be the final point because we've had yeah, nearly it, an hour it, and a it's, half it's now. Just a question. This is the first time there's been a vote since I've been on the committee. Can I establish who is and who isn't allowed to vote? Are co-opted members like myself allowed to vote? Uh, I, I think I'm going to have to ban you from voting, Mr. Strong. We, we just, yeah, I, I, I think it's elected members and... Leanne can't vote, but Mike can. Okay. Yeah, and, and only committee members from elected members that are here this morning. Uh, lovely as it is to see wider councillor representation here. So that uh, agreed, uh, including Councillor Brown's small amendment that future consultation will also take Chepstow into full account. If you could show whether you support that, please. Is there anybody voting against? There we are, then that's carried unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and again, thank you very much to the parents who have come along with such eloquence to uh, state their cases. Councillor Smith. Chairman, yeah, can I just uh, satisfy my curiosity? Nothing to do with this vote that's been taken. Why have I and colleagues here in this room had to declare our interests? I, as a grandma, child, um, a member who has distanced himself completely. Why do we have to declare an interest when in another form it isn't necessary? I, I think the reason is that we're being ultra cautious because if you think back to certainly uh, one of the public meetings that were held, there were accusations made that councillors uh, had a personal interest in that they might have children or grandchildren at schools concerned. And my view is that we need to be ultra clear. Uh, and that is solely the reason why, Councillor Smith. But if that applies in this forum, it should apply elsewhere. Just a thinking in my mind, Chairman. I'll... Sorry, Mr. Chair. Councillor Smith, which forum did an elected member not have to declare an interest? Declare an interest here now. I'm purely here as an observer this morning to listen to the debate, and it's been good. Um, when this goes to, so having declared an interest that if I was a member of this committee would presumably bar me from voting on the issues. No? Only, no. that would only be the case if a member was to have a prejudicial interest in the matter was being discussed. And as I said in my comments earlier, the legal advice has been that there is not a prejudicial interest. Yes. So members are right to declare their position, absolutely. And I think as the chair said, in terms of transparency, it's a really appropriate right. thing to do, but okay. it's not a prejudicial position for them to declare and remove themselves from the meeting. So okay, is, is that, uh, I, I, much as I love debating with you, Councillor no, Smith, I'm fine. anxious about time, and yep. Councillor Eason wishes to come in. From curiosity, I watching the debate this morning, it was a good debate. What has happened to, to Dunnock, Alan Hennock on your, on your clusters? Okay, so um, the Tredunac and Lanhenac area currently fall outside of Ask Primary School's catchment area, um, so they don't form part of these proposals. So those small areas there, um, because of their proximity to Killian, although their Monmouthshire residents will remain to be part of Killian's catchment. But in future, after a number of years, will they become part of Monmouthshire's catchment or will, will they remain in, in Killian? Because on, your maps su suggest that they will not be part of Monmouthshire's catchment in the future. In line with these proposals, the, the decision was taken not to um, include those areas, just to align Ask Primary School catchment. Obviously, if in future, proposals are brought forward by Newport to amend the catchment areas, we clearly would need to look at those areas uh, to make sure they're aligned to a Monmouthshire secondary school. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on at this point. Uh, just, Mr McLean. Just really for clarity on that point, those areas that have just been discussed aren't 
part of a Monmouthshire primary catchment. They are in Newport primary catchments, so they have that ongoing relationship with Killian. So that's why they were not included in this piece. Okay, um, parents, you are more than welcome to remain, but I can fully understand it if you wish at this point to, to leave. Uh, thank you very much indeed for coming and making your input this morning. Um, we'll move on to agenda item four. Uh, Mr. McLean's just gone to get a drink of water, which I, I think we might allow him time to do. Um, but... Um, Having, uh, having just debated one potentially contentious issue, we move on to another, which is, of course, the future of Mountain House. Um, I'll just uh, wait before we kick off until Mr. McLean returns to the room. Chair, can, can we have a... Sh are you calling a short recess, Chair? Beg your pardon? Are you calling a short recess? Um, yes, uh, literally uh, three minutes. So if anybody else needs water, powder their noses, or whatever it is that men do. Yeah. 
Um, I, I suspect my vice chair uh, may well be in considerable discomfort having sat in these rather uncomfortable chairs for a full hour one week before she's due to give birth. <laughs> so uh, she is just having a walk around, but um, I, I'm going to restart in case she's not able to come back and join us. Um, just to, to recap uh, what I said at the start of the meeting, this is slightly different in, in that this, we're still in the formal consultation phase here uh, and, and we have no, no parents who might be anxious uh, about speaking. So we're we going to revert to a more normal uh, approach and thank you for your indulgence in letting me handle that uh, previous agenda item in the way that we did, but I think it, it worked. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is to invite officers to introduce the topic uh, and then uh, members of the committee to make comments, and then other elected members who might wish to comment, followed by uh, other representatives, the, the school trade union rep, um, a, a, and do it in that more normal method. So that said, uh, Mr. McLean. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to, to be clear at the outset uh, of... Uh, my input this morning about where we are in the process um, and how that will uh, mean that we kind of uh, undertake this discussion. Um, we are now in formal consultation uh, as agreed by Cabinet on the 6th of March. Um, the call-in period for that decision concluded on the 15th of March uh, and following that the consultation was launched on the 18th. So we are still in the first week of that process. So this is a live consultation exercise. I think it's right and proper that I set out to you as a committee um, the contextual background position that led us to a position of us asking the question. Um, beyond that, uh, I do not intend to enter a debate um, or to query or to qualify any comments that are made in the chamber. From that point on, we will be listening and taking down the information that uh, members of the committee wish to provide and I think that's the appropriate thing to do. The decision will be taken um, as how to proceed by Cabinet uh, on the 6th of June. Um, papers for that will obviously be shared fully uh, prior to that. They will be in the public domain. Uh, and of course, we will comply fully with all of our statutory obligations around the consultation exercise and the publication of all consultation responses that we receive. Obviously, uh, clerks of the committee today will be taking notes of the discussion that we have here, but the meeting is also recorded, so any comments will be captured that way. So you can be confident that, uh, that they will be captured as part of that consultation exercise. I think the first thing that I really want to say to Cabinet and to this committee um, is that the decision to enter the consultation exercise around the closure of the school is not one that we take lightly and not one that we take um, with any sense um, uh, of this being something that doesn't have an impact and that won't have an impact uh, on children, um, on staff, on governors and people who care about that institution. But because people have strong feelings about something doesn't necessarily mean it's not the right thing to do in asking that question. And that's simply what we are doing at this stage of the process, is asking that question. So Mountain House Special School uh, is a school within Monmouthshire, situated in the village of Pulmeric, um, that is a school for boys aged 11 to 16 with social, emotional, behavioural difficulties. Um, 
The school has a capacity of 58 pupils, um, and currently there are 21 children on roll. The number of children on roll at the school has been in decline over the recent period of time, from 43 in 2014 over the last five years to 21 as we sit here today. So this is one of the factors that led us to ask that question. I think it would be really important to recognise um, some of the challenges that the school has faced uh, during that period um, and that in May 2015, uh, following uh, an Eston inspection, the school was placed into significant improvement. Uh, at the same time, through categorisation processes with the EAS, the school was categorised as red. I think in every setting that I've been in, I want to recognise absolutely the commitment and the effort that the staff and the leadership of the school have made in seeing that school removed from the significant improvement categorisation and now to be categorised as a yellow school. And I think that's really important that we do recognise that. However, there are a broader set of concerns and challenges for us as a local authority as we move forward around how we provide for all of our children with additional learning needs. Mountain House caters for a very small proportion of the children who need additional support in our educational system. Some of that is because of the designation um, of the school and the way that is structured. So the school can only take children who are male and only of the age 11 to 16. And clearly that is a significant constraint on the school. That might be a factor that has led to that falling role. And clearly as well, neighbouring authorities in the Gwent area have also ad created additional capacity for that, how they support children with social and emotional behavioural needs in that um, period of time from 2014 to 2019. Members of this committee will also be aware that last year we consulted on a broader range of additional learning need reforms across the authority. Within those reforms, Mountain House played a key role in the future of that provision. However, during our modelling and financial um, planning for those changes, we had um, established what we felt was a prudent um, allowance of £2 million of capital investment to make the site fit for purpose for um, full age range, both male and female. Sorry about the, uh, the feedback on the, the microphone. However, when we came to move beyond the modelling and firm up those costs, the costs that were reported back to us by property services at Monmouthshire County Council were not £2 million, but rather £6.4 million. And that was to afford the school the opportunity to have proper zones so that boys and girls could be educated appropriately, but also that we could, on what is actually a relatively small site, meet the needs of both boys and girls and make sure that safeguarding and appropriate separation was maintained where necessary. Now clearly those additional 4.4 million pounds worth of investment would bring with them a substantive revenue tail that we would have to afford. It was determined at that point that that additional revenue cost meant that a prudential borrowing route to affording that capital investment would no longer be possible as it would simply um, consume all of the benefit that we were hoping to reinvest elsewhere in our ALN system. I've talked about the broader needs of children within Monmouthshire and I think it is just worth reflecting a little bit about the place that SEBD um, features within that kind of those levels of need. One of the comments which well, one of the aspects which will illustrate that is that there are 21 pupils currently on roll at Mountain House, two of which are residential, but only seven of which are Monmouthshire pupils. And I think that's really important in just setting the context and the number of pupils that it's able to support from Monmouthshire. And without sounding crude or too, um, too simplistic, my role is to support the children in Monmouthshire and their educational needs. In terms of the challenges that our schools face, many of you will be aware that head teachers often, through your roles as governors, talk around the changing nature of behaviour in our classrooms. 
And clearly, the management of behaviour in our classrooms is becoming a greater challenge for our schools. And children are presenting with more complex needs that have to be managed and supported. However, when we look at the actual statistical profile of what types of need present in Monmouthshire schools, of the top five, SEBD is the second lowest. So in order of the top, 30% of those additional learning needs requirements feature around autistic spectrum disorder. Combined medical and physical needs account for 19%. Then there is 12.9% with social and emotional behavioral needs and 11.25% with speech, language and communication. So Mountain House, even providing this type of support that it does currently, isn't meeting our greatest number of learners who need that support. And I think that's important that we recognise that. Elsewhere, where I've talked about this proposition, and I've talked about it quite extensively already this week, I met with head teachers yesterday morning and with um, the finance forum last night of the authority, I have talked about the cost of placing pupils, Monmouthshire pupils, into Mountain House School. Mountain House costs circa 1.6, 1.7 million pounds a year to run as an institution. At the moment, with seven Monmouthshire pupils there, so taking into account the netting off effect of the recruitment that we gain from the schools outside of county who place into the school, it costs us for those seven pupils 114,000 pounds per pupil. As of September 19, following the departure of the current year 11s, there will be six Monmouthshire pupils in school. The cost then will be £154,000 per pupil. Um, the slight differentiation between that and when I provided a briefing to the committee and where we've discussed this elsewhere um, is the addition of two pupils in the intervening period. So some of these are moving numbers between the points in time which we're reporting various aspects. However, we do expect that by September 2020, there will only be four Monmouthshire pupils in school, and at that point in time, the costs are expected to be £233,000 per pupil. By any estimation, that is a significant cost, and a significant cost for a local authority to be, to be placing in its own provision. As a guide, and no more than that, and this is not a judgment about the quality of education or support that is offered in different institutions, a placement at Headland School, which is run by Action for Children in Penarth, costs circa £45,000. And a placement at Talica, um, which is a, an independent school within Monmouthshire, costs circa £60,000. So significant differences there in terms of how we manage our own costs. And they would be for broadly similar cohorts of children. So we can see that there are several concerns that are kind of crystallising at once. One is around the nature of the school, its designation and its ability to meet the needs of both boys and girls. One is around a more strategic or I guess a broader piece around the changing nature of ALN need within our county and also the changing nature of ALN management and administration with the introduction of the new act and a new code of practice. I think it's worthwhile just reflecting a little bit on the fact that Mountain House was clearly a part of the provision for children of Gwent County Council when Gwent was a single entity. And Gwent had across what is now five counties a range of different provisions. And it is by circumstance of geography um, that Mountain House is the provision that is in Monmouthshire. You know, if the border had been drawn a couple of miles to the west, Crown Bridge would be in Monmouthshire, for instance. And so that is something that we just need to be aware of. So it's not an institution that has been created in Monmouthshire to support the needs of Monmouthshire pupils. This range of challenges that we face has led us to a position whereby, as officers, we felt it was appropriate to advise the Cabinet to ask the question in a formal way. Now, I know the Chair made reference to the use of indicative votes, and that's obviously highly pertinent at the moment. Um, I, and I don't want to draw any comparison to anybody else trying to establish something with a simple yes-no question. I just think, at this moment in time, it's absolutely appropriate that we crystallise the issues that exist around Mountain House, 
that we crystallize the issues around its affordability for us as an authority. We crystallize the issues around its suitability in providing the right education, not for a group of children who are clearly vulnerable and need support, but for the group of children within Monmouthshire who are vulnerable and need support. And it's really important that we ask that question and we gather as many views as we can from as many different perspectives as we can to help Cabinet come to an informed decision in June about how they feel that this school should proceed into the future. As I said right at the outset, this is not a decision that we have taken lightly. It's not a decision that we take any pleasure in progressing. But I do think it's absolutely appropriate that we ask the question at this time. I think that's all I want to say in introduction. If there are points of clarity or questioning during the uh, morning, then of course I will be happy to take those. But um, I think that will be all I say for the beginning. Thank you very much for that introduction. <laughs> uh, colleagues, Mr Strong. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would like to um, oppose the um, proposal to, to close Mountain House and to speak really in support of option three that was presented to the cabinet uh, which is on page 71 uh, of your agendas that is to change the type of provision uh, at, at, at mountain house um, i since the uh, the beginning of our period of austerity going back what 10 years now i've attended many meetings um, organized by monmouthshire county council sometimes as uh, an employee sometimes as a resident sometimes as a member of various committees. And we've been told time and time again that, that, that Monmouthshire's approach to these challenges has, has always been to try to avoid closure. We pair back where necessary, we adapt and change where necessary. But if we close, the, the, the wording that I've heard from the, um, at the front before is that once it's gone, it's gone. So we try to avoid closure. It's also been Monmouthshire's approach where possible to do things uh, within county. That's both geographically within county and in-house in terms of the, the council providing the, the services. We, we've had, for example, recently on this committee uh, a very good discussion about the um, importance of the enhanced uh, fostering uh, scheme being brought um, in-house. It seems to me that the proposal to, uh, to close Mountain House goes very much against Monmouthshire's policy. It goes very much against the, the well-being agenda. Um, Will has paid tribute to the staff at Mountain House who are giving those children the best starts uh, in life, given the, the, the very difficult circumstances in which many of them have been, uh, 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 have been brought up. And, and because all this goes against that approach, the, the case for closure needs to be absolutely compelling. And I don't think it is compelling. The question has been asked, but I think the answer is, uh, is, is no. Clearly, a lot hinges on finance, and the, the figures we've been given are predicated on the existing uh, numbers and uh, um, an assumption that numbers will continue to decline. Um, I don't believe that if you go for option three, which is changing the type of provision, that is necessarily the case. But I will allow others to deal with that because they have a more in-depth knowledge than, than me. I'm particularly concerned that the consultation um, really um, lacks um, any detail of alternative strategy. We're told that, should the, and I'm quoting, should the proposals to close Mountain House proceed, the council will consider opportunities to invest in a new delivery model. Uh, well, many of us know the fate of alternative delivery models. Um, that, that, is, that is very vague, and I think it's so vague that it, it almost renders the consultation meaningless because there's no real chance to judge between um, the, um, uh, the alternatives. We see on page uh, 88 to 89 um, of the agendas, uh, 15, 16 of the consultation, uh, various um, options, various um, advantages listed for option two, the closure of Mountain House. But it strikes me that those advantages are... are, are that they really depend upon um, the, um, this vague alternative being A, put into place, and B, operating successfully. Um, I'm not convinced that either will happen, and certainly that either will happen 
uh, in time and be allowed to be uh, tested. I'm a bit reminded of um, Disraeli saying that there's a world of difference between the promise of a lover and the performance of a husband. <laughs> we know. <laughs> well, I'll leave you to, to, to consider that. But I, I really do think that the, the, the alternatives are, are at this stage too vague, um, that we need to go back and ask more questions about those alternatives and, and that we, we could not close Mountain House, certainly within the time span that's offered, um, uh, until those alternatives are properly thrashed out. Thank you very much. Um, could I just take one more, uh, Councillor Brown, and then invite you to respond? Because I think they... It's a point of clarity. Uh, oh, okay, it's a point of clarity rather than a, a, a response. Just to be very clear about why we did not put an alternative provision in. If we had done so, we would have had to have fully costed that. That would be the only way we could have done that. The only way we could have done that would have been to take in a presumption about the future of Mountain House. So we have purposefully not included that because if we, it was seen that we had costed an alternative solution that was predicated on Mountain House closing, then this would have been a predetermined consultation exercise. So we have absolutely kept this neutral in that sense at this stage simply to allow us, when we get to a position of time that we report to Cabinet, the Cabinet paper, if it was to conclude that Mountain House should close, would then include a proposal for how the additional learning needs would be met in the future. Very quickly, Mr Strong. Yeah. I, I take the point, but e equally, uh, we are entitled to point out that there are alternatives to closure. It's not just a matter of, um, you know, close it or pay you know, an arm and a leg for a very small number of pupils. Yeah, uh, I, th this is part of the consultation process, so points like that will certainly be noted for consideration when it comes to Cabinet. Uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm very much in support of the uh, original option three that the uh, Cabinet was presented with, and that's basically to change the type of provision offered at Mountain House Special School to meet the requirements of the in-county growing need, but, uh, but I would add on a transitional basis. Um, the reason for the, this argument is basically going back to the consultation we had in May 2019. And looking at that, um, there, were, uh, there was a table of all the advantages that would be if, if we went for this wider provision. It said, um, just to list some of those, and they're on page 11 and 12 of the original consultation, will meet the needs of the majority of children and young people within the county. It, it'll uh, provide an opportunity for children and young people to be educated within their local community where appropriate by enhancing the capacity of schools, enabling them to provide for a wider range of ALN and behavioral needs. Provide a cohesive and holistic approach to meeting the needs of the majority of learners, irrespective of need, age or gen gender. New provision would ensure continuity of provision for almost all children and young people from three to 19 years within the county. Maximise the use of resources at our disposal, including sharing staff, expertise and developing strong school-to-school -school working. Uh, the number of children and young people required to attend out of co county placements would reduce. Um, the financial impact on pupils and uh, other service areas would reduce significantly. Now, um, effectively, there was only a couple of disadvantages that were put in that table. One was to do with the very small number of children um, who, who basically access education out, out, out of county play, placements and the cost of uh, change, risk of disruption to service delivery. In fact, the consultation says that there are 16 out of county children who um, have ASD and SEB D needs and I understand even within the SEBD children who go to Mountain House currently that um, they do display ASD traits in any event. Um, previously the school has Previously, the school has, um, anyway, even if they don't, part of this consultation to widen it was to include AS, ASD pupils. Now, if we actually look at the uh, consultation itself, um, you'll see that if you go um, to look at the reducing numbers, which is one of the 
things which I think you can find on page 86 um, in our agenda. You can see how they've gradually uh, declined, even from January uh, 2018, from 32 to 21. Well, apparently when this consultation was um, uh, undertaken in May 2018, um, which was based on the idea that we would just have Monmouthshire pupils only, then, in fact, um, the other authorities were written to, to um, tell them this. And so, obviously, from their point of view, um, you know, it, it would not encourage additional numbers from out of county in the financial uh, assistance that would be got from that particular thing and then the uncertainty of the school has continued in terms of you know we're going to review the school I understand that they have had inquiries from Cardiff um, Vale of Glamorgan and um, uh, another New Newport recently so there is an interest um, out of county and when the provisions were put forward originally, we were told how this was modelled on the Newport model, who are actually, uh, and there's also a, a school called Trinity Fields in Caerphilly, um, where they have got a specialist type, type of provision. And in the Newport one, I think they got 3.5 million from the 21st century school programme, and it was based to increase their provision from 100 to 150 uh, because they'd got um, about three sites with, with 50 children on each. And so they are looking at that as well. And in fact, are we saying that there's no um, in-county need? Well, I don't think we are because there is a table on page 91 um, which says um, in 8.2, the table below shows the current number of children with a statement for either behavioural dif difficulties or ASD, and that number's 130. And obviously that's without um, consideration of the uh, SEBD uh, issue. There is also the uh, fact that um, there is very strong support in the community for continuing uh, Mountain House School. And the reason for that is, is because it obviously uh, deals with children who, who can't um, operate successfully in mainstream school and who have very challenging behaviour. And the staff there are totally committed and they turn these children's lives around. And I think we've got to look at it from a different perspective in terms of the well-being of the children as well, because in fact, the, um, uh, the, our corporate plan and, and public uh, services board well-being is, is to give all children in Monmouthshire the best start in life. Now, recently, the council has uh, supported um, SEND. These children are also vulnerable children in need of support. And, you know, they have um, additional learning needs because basically the categorization of additional learning needs now covers a wide range of things, SEBD, um, ASD, and, um, you know, severe learning difficulties. So they are part of the, uh, uh, you know, ALN need uh, spectrum and in fact what we also need to consider is the impact um, not only um, in relation to the fact that these children will get better provision in school we also need to consider the fact that um, it will affect mainstream <coughs> pupils as well because if you've got a very challenging um, pupil in your class then it can result in it great difficulty for the other pupils as well. I was told recently by a parent how um, there was a, a child in a class that had such challenging behaviour that the whole um, class had to be taken out and moved to another location because of that particular pupil's behaviour. So it will also impact main, mainstream schools as well. The other issue is, is that in terms of its yellow categorisation, it is, it is categorised as adequate. And our secondary schools are number of those come in that category anyway so I don't think that that is a particular issue um, I don't 
actually buy the uh, financial um, aspect of this because, in fact, um, it's, uh, uh, there is the issue that, that when they were originally going for this proposal is the savings on the cost of the potential 16 children that we pay for out of county. So I, I still think, and I've worked on the financial side of, even if we had to pay 6.4 million, I still think there is a potential saving there, actually, if you look at it in a different perspective. But I'm not suggesting that at this stage. What I'm suggesting is that we look at the keeping it, support it uh, fully, uh, keep it keep it going, gradually widen the number of pupils so that instead of it being 11 to 16, it might be 9 to, 6, 9 to 16. And then we look at um, eventually transitioning to a point of um, uh, where, we, where we can perhaps in the next tranche of the um, uh, 21st century school look, look at more, more work on the school so that we can cover the growing need that's within our county for help in this area. And it isn't just the growing need in relation to the table that's already within the consultation. It's the growing need in terms of the number of exclusions that we've had. And in fact, the Mountain House School, in a sense, has evolved in different ways as well because it's actually doing things like um, uh, 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 plumbing uh, and building and carpentry and offering BTEC solutions in here. And already between the head and the uh, school, um, where there have been pupils with challenging behaviour, they've been allowed to attend the school and provide a, a good respite type of relief for the school itself being trained in these sort of things that they actually find more interesting and give them a better start in life. So there's an enormous amount of potential in that school. And I, I have actually been, by seeing the staff and seeing the he head, I had a fairly neutral position to start with. But I, I think I've been overwhelmed by the su support and encouragement that they give these children and the potential for this resource to be used um, for the good of Monmouthshire pupils. And I, I, I really think it will be uh, the wrong decision, and I can go through fi figures with you and so forth, but I think it's more a case of where there's a will, there's a way. And we've got Will here, and I'm just hoping that he's going to <laughs> find the way through this. But I don't think it's a financial issue. I think, I don't think, I'd, and I think that, you know, with increasing pupil numbers, with giving the good... Uh, support to the uh, schools and, 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 and everything else. We've got a jolly good f facility there. It's got a million pound that was spent on a gym there. And, you know, it's got an enormous amount of potential. And it also impacts our looked after children because five out of the um, 21 pupils, I understand, are looked after children. So we're talking about vulnerable kids here. Now, you know, you've got, you've got to really think about how that's going to impact their future. And if people don't believe how strongly the uh, community feels about it, I would direct you to uh, change.org, which has got a petition to stop the Mountain House school closure. And there's, at the moment, it was only started two weeks ago, and it's already got about 2,200 people signing in support of maintaining the school because of how much it's, it's valued and how much it's appreciated and how much it will be such a great shame to um, uh, uh, a school with so much potential um, to, to, to lose. And I don't think the answer is, um, uh, you know, uh, teaching assistants um, helping uh, pupils in their own classroom or in the corridor is the same as the intensive support that they could get from this, this um, type of, of school and this type of support and this type of provision. And also for, for the um, pupils, it gives them a, a, a sense of belonging, a, a sense of really being cared for. And I don't think you can put a price on that and I think those sort of things need to be considered. And in, you can go to that uh, change.org and you can see all the comments that have made there as to why they want this school 
um, to be maintained, to be expanded. Looking at the building itself, um, we had this idea that it was 6.4 million. Well, I've been to the school, and it's actually, if you speak to the staff, it's quite quite actually practically fairly easy. I appreciate the safeguarding concerns to actually divide the school because it's in separate different it's in different blocks that are are actually separated out quite well and you and you know fencing and so forth could be put up. I think the six point four million I've asked for the breakdown of the figures, but I mean that apparently comes from um, uh, I think the school have had a visit um, for an hour and a half and I've asked for the breakdown of how that works but I'm, we're not talking about actually having great modifications we're talking about you know as pupils from other areas uh, come in then we could look at doing that on a on a transitional s stage at one stage this school was earning the um, authority a profit of one million. Why, why are you applying to this uh, school the fact that it shouldn't actually cost the authority anything? Because I'm not aware that that is applied in other schools. We realise that there are ongoing costs in relation to schools. So I'd like to know why this derogatory um, criteria is being applied uh, to, the, to this type of school because schools do need support. They will have running costs. Um, you know, for example, if we go in for a Welsh medium school in uh, Monmouthshire, even if it's going to cost 100, um, even if you get 100% capital cost uh, from the uh, Welsh government, it's still going to cost about half a million for this school to actually uh, earn revenue costs to keep going. And I think. Um, if we then look look forward, if we carry on with this on a transitional basis till we get to the next 21st century school, then special schools actually get 75% um, funding from the Welsh Government. So if you're actually talking about, say, £7 million, um, pounds, then it would actually cost um, us less than the £2 million that we'd originally put aside. And in terms of revenue, Costs. It would actually be um, uh, 36,000 per uh, million concerned. Now that's actually 72,000. That's the equivalent to one child place, and the the numbers fluctuate. So I don't think there's a strong argument in favour of closure. I think there's a jolly good and strong argument in favour of the excellent proposals that um, Will supported last year. Um, to have the same sort of model that Newport has got and that have, has Cofilia has got and that's, that serves the children there well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Before I, I bring in Mr. McLean to answer that, uh, I, I would just say to the representatives here from Mountain House that when you go back to school, I hope you'll tell people that your local member put up an extremely spirited defence of your school. Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank Councillor Brown for doing that this morning. Uh, I've got Councillor Thomas uh, uh, and Mr Fowler, but I think that, uh, in, in fairness to our Chief Officer, he has the right to reply in the immediate. So, Mr McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just a, a couple of points, and I did say that I wasn't going to engage in debate or discussion just, but it's actually really important for us just to hear your concerns and so on. I think... Just a couple of things in terms of some of the wider pieces that you've talked about. In terms of developments in other local authorities and the type of development in other local authority, I think that's been one of the factors that has reduced the number of children who apply to Mountain House because they have invested in their own capacity over time, and I think that's one of those issues. Um, the capital point around Band B and Band C. School capital is hugely, hugely expensive. We know already the very, very challenging conversations that we have had within this organisation around trying to prioritise um, King Henry VIII School um, above Chepstow School for Band B investment. Not a decision that was taken easily um, and one that I know local members to Chepstow still feel concerned by and raise regularly in this chamber. The additional pressure of a further £7 million in Band C, when we don't know if they will maintain 75% intervention rate or anything else, makes that quite a difficult position for me to, 
to really begin to work through because councillors have made a very, very clear commitment to the renewal of Chepstow Comprehensive School in Band C. That has been explicitly stated by Councillor John at full council. Knowing how challenging austerity has been and will continue to be into the foreseeable future, a further capital cost, even at the intervention rate of 75% of circa £2 million, £2.5 million, brings with it challenges for us. And I think we just need to be conscious of those. And Ban C doesn't start until 2024. Can the current school continue until 2024? I don't know. I think it's a fair point to have raised, but I just would raise concerns around committing to additional funds in Ban C um, for that expenditure. Uh, is, this, is this a combat of specific... Yeah, I mean, I've looked into this in quite a bit of detail because I've been, yeah, you know, I'm a bit of a researcher, I'm afraid. Um, but, um, in fact, uh, the situation of, um, you know, that when you put in the for the 21st century schools, um, I think it's a question of, um, you know, the different authorities have put in different um, uh, envelopes in uh, terms can, of... Can, can I stop you just for one second, just, just for some clarity for my own thinking here? What we're going through as a committee this morning is, is making suggestions and proposals potentially around the closure of Mountain House School. Um, we're now talking, I suspect, about wider issues moving forward. And as Mr McLean has pointed out, his role here this morning isn't to engage in debate um, because that would not be proper. Um, is the point that you're point. going to yeah. make now yeah. around the closure of Mountain House or is it primarily around the development of Chepstow? I, th I think it's just a, a question of the fact that obviously it was a priority of the council in terms of Chepstow, which is still a priority. But all I'm saying is, is obviously, um, you know, it's changed in terms of it originally being 50% and it's now 65%. And for special schools, it's 75%. And for voluntary aided schools, it's 85% contribution. And I think that makes a, a significant difference to the finances. Thank you. Yeah, I, I take that point. Uh, Councillor Thomas. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I must admit, I, I, I've looked at this. I, I don't know this school. I haven't been there, um, but I, I, I know the, the area, Monmouthshire, fairly well. I, I've got to be honest, I, I feel very opposed to the closure of the school. I, I, I would say that categorically. Uh, in my mind, I would opt for, for option three of keeping the school open, uh, changing the provision, and obviously making provision for both boys uh, and girls. Um, it's almost ironic that on the last agenda item, well, the agenda item we started with today, everybody was saying, well, we must keep our children in Monmouthshire. If they're born in Monmouthshire, you pay, your parents pay their council tax in Monmouthshire, then you should have that say. But now, with this, we're going to the totally opposite end of the spectrum and saying, well, it's costing us a bit more. Uh, let, let, let's send them to Penarth or let's send them to Taloka, which is a... a a, a private um, provider and I, I feel very much um, opposed to that um, and, and really if, if I had a special needs child I, I, I would want to move to Caerphilly area or I would want to move to um, Newport area so that they could go to, um, new, to Crown Ridge um, rather than have, having them best all over the place plus the, the disruption to the, to the children themselves. The other sort of irony today is um, we're saying six million odd is, is too much which okay yes it is a large amount of money uh, but this authority a couple of weeks ago spent 21 million buying um, a retail and a leisure park in Newport it's not even in the authority and I think the word was used well it will use prudent borrowing now if you're going to use prudent borrowing for 21 million um, for uh, you know uh, Councillor Thomas could, could you stick to Mountain House right please? okay well I, I, I think that's important but the travelling to Penarth the long distance um, on the bus Personally, I've got a huge concern for the pupils, but also the staff. And I, I, I really feel very opposed to this closure. Thank you. Uh, from the Chair, I have to say I've seen no suggestion anywhere that people would be busting any numbers to out-of-county provision. But Mr McLean? I think it's really important, and we've spoken about this a lot recently, especially as a region, as we work ever closer together, I think the in-and-out-of-county language is hugely difficult 
Because if I have a child in Abergavenny and, I want my, and we determine that Mountain House is the place for that child, that is not an easy drive to Mountain House. It's in county, but it's 50 minutes across difficult roads and so on. It's 20 minutes down the road to Crown Bridge. You know, and I think we've got to just think about actually the provision and the accessibility of places for children in a slightly broader way than what's in county good, out of county bad. Clearly, proximity to the um, type of provision you need to access is really important. What we're talking about is about levels of need. So just to go back to an earlier point was this kind of, I think, a very unfair presumption that we will close Mountain House and simply put children back into mainstream with a one-to-one, -one, which is a gross misrepresentation of anything that, my, that myself or any of my officers have ever inferred. And I think that we need to be really clear that actually we're talking about levels of need. Really, Mountain House serves the most challenging children, those with the greatest levels of need. We know that by virtue of the fact that they are statemented children. So it's not a solution at the moment that serves the great number of children. So I think it's really important that we just hold some of these frameworks and constructs in our minds and in terms of how we take that forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr Fowler. Um, I'm, I'm going to come at this from a very different point of view, um, especially having sat in my own school this week and tried to balance the budget and know that uh, money is tight in a mainstream school and that there is ever more growing pressures on us year on year on year. So to that view, I looked to Mountain House and it has this very tight designation of teenage boys with the SEBD um, and it faces um, falling numbers. So as in this committee we've seen uh, in recent months, uh, the funding formula has already changed to remove an extra 250,000 out of the budget. As those numbers continue to fall, that's going to repeat itself and more chunks of that budget will, will have to be taken out of it and then you have to balance that with the level of service that can be provided as the costs go up. Um, so to my mind, the only way of keeping Mountain House open under its current form is to get those numbers back up. And if those numbers aren't forthcoming, forthcoming then, then that's it. That's, if they're not forthcoming, then the, the solution is simple. But it's the very tight designation of that at the moment that stops those numbers growing up, as we can see. Um, and just to my mind, it's not affordable. It, 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 if we can see that the independent sector can charge us £65,000 or circa £60,000 per placement, and being independent, they turn a profit on that, it seems scandalous that we can spend public money on what would be 100 and whatever the figure was, 130 um, thousand per placement and and as uh, seeing that in the wider ALN envelope that difference in cost would go to help an awful lot more children with ALN in the county where provision is actually being squeezed thank you uh, in that this is part of the consultation exercise I, I, I feel that as chair I'm able to express my own personal view as well which which I will do and then I'll invite um, uh, other members who are not members of the committee, if, if they've got any comments, and then the school. Uh, but but uh, from the chair, uh, my own professional background has been uh, very much concerned with youngsters with, with very challenging behaviour over many years now. It's, it's a point I noted yesterday that one of my heroes in education, um, Professor... Um, Warnock uh, died yesterday uh, and Professor Warnock headed up the Royal Commission in the uh, 1980s, uh, late 70s, that transformed the way we think about special education. It's interesting also that in England, although not yet in Wales, where uh, children are designated uh, with the types of difficulty uh, those at Mountain House are, uh, are, have, they're referred to as children with social 
emotional and mental health illness. They are not seen as uh, children with bad behaviour. Uh, and I think that one thing that we must be absolutely clear on as an authority is that if we were to close Mountain House, that the money that would be saved is not just put into a general pot that would enable schools to provide a bit more nursery nurse or teach an assistant cover to support children whose primary needs are around behaviour, which often is linked with things like social deprivation, inability of parents to, to bring up their children effectively, but is not the same thing as a diagnosed mental illness. I think that what we need as an authority to be very careful about is that we work closely with the health authority, with CAMS and similar provision, through the public service board to ensure that those youngsters with diagnosed medical difficulties who make their education extremely challenging are given the sort of care and provision that they need. Be that in a special school or in a unit attached to a mainstream school or wherever. It's ironic that in our previous uh, agenda item this morning, we concentrated on the need for children to remain together within their communities. And yet here, some members of this committee are quite happily talking about busing children for getting on for two hours a day to attend school at a very specialist school, but a school that does not serve its local community. Certainly in all the years when I worked for Gwent, I did not place one Putmyrick child at Mountain House School. I did place lots from Abergavenny, lots from the Newport area, and we are now talking post-Warnock, post-educational development, that children should primarily and wherever possible be taught in their local community. No one is suggesting that it is cheap to deal with the education of children with such challenging behaviour as those dealt with at Mountain House. I have been aware of the level of those difficulties, both through my own teaching and then in latter years through my inspection and the training of teachers to work in such schools. I think that for what it's worth, my contribution to this debate is that we should seek to educate children as near as possible to their local community in schools that meet their needs, but at the same time do not allow those needs to impact on the wider education of other children in our local community schools. It will not be cheap, but at the same time, I think it gives a far better model than putting all children from county in a, in, in a place that is not fit for purpose as we move through the 21st century. So I'm afraid I disagree with some of the comments made by members of the committee this morning. Uh, now, uh, having said that, are there any other elected members who would wish to make a contribution before? Yeah, okay, Councillor Pavia. Th uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously not gonna rehash some of the things have already been said, you know, uh, Mr. Strong and, and um, Councillor Brown were really strong, as was Councillor, um, sorry, was, was Judah as, as well, um, and yourself. Um, but it, I, th I think there's a, the few points that I like to make. Um, first is the significant amount of st staff dissatisfaction, I think, about, about the consultation process and, and prior to the consultation process, you know, Having, having gone in uh, with Councillor Brown the uh, week before last, had a really good detailed discussion with staff. Um, 
they feel that they've been on the periphery of this uh, and they haven't been engaged with. Um, I know we've criticised other organisations of the past, n namely the Health Board, in not involving us uh, as an authority in the shaping of options appraisals. Um, and j just thinking, obviously, one particular incident with, with, with Chepstow Hospital. Um, you know, I think staff could have been involved in shaping the options appraisals, the, 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 the options appraisal process that, that could have gone out for consultation, and, and they should have been, I, I think, involved in that. Um, in terms of um, the cost, uh, you know, I think there's some questions to understand about the rigour and rationale out. First, the, the £2 million contingency cost that was initially budgeted for, and then, you know, how it tripled in, in, in cost um, f following a, a, another process. You know, what was that process? It would be in interesting to understand the cost breakdown of that and how that was, th that was done. Um, one of the points I don't think has been mentioned is that the, the amount of um, outreach work the staff do uh, with, with the other secondary schools, a significant amount of outreach. Uh, I know they've taken in children who are not statemented to do some one-to-one -one work within the school. Um, you know, those costs, you know, I'm not saying that, they, you know, we should be cross-charging, uh, but, you know, there has to be some element of um, funding that needs to follow the child, you know, so should they need p particular uh, interventions and bespoke interventions, then that cost needs to be uh, uh, applied to that. Um, in terms of um, transporting children out of county, um, you know, I was made aware that there's at least two children in the north of the county in Abergavenny that are being bused to Cardiff uh, uh, across to Penarth at a huge cost on a daily basis. You know, that can't be right. That can't be right. You know, I understand what, what, what the chief officer says about, you know, in, in county good, out, out of county bad. You know, that, that's, that we shouldn't be framing it in those, in those terms. And, you know, the provision should be about, you know, that particular child and the child's needs. But I can't see that why we, you know, we can't have that provision here and develop that provision if it's not there at the minute. That we can't develop that provision over over a short period of time. Um, you, know, you know, again, you know, chief officer says about it's a sort of a historic facility that you know that we've acquired over time. But you know, let's be clear, you know. In terms of the ALN outcome of the, of the review, it was a, it, you know Mountain House was going to be a central plank going forward. So so you know we we can't I I, I you can't extrapolate one from the other. You know I don't think you know I understand the cost pressures absolutely. You know and I've I'm I've been standing up with with likes of Councillor Brown, Councillor Devi, Champion, and um, you know the future of Chapstow School. You know and I I you know I, I acutely. Um, aware of the pressures, but I think you know that there, there must be a way uh, of a, a rolling a rolling provision looking at that option three um, that we can redevelop um, services on that site because it is a, a unique site. It's a unique site not just for the county. It's, it's probably one of the unique sites in Wales. I mean, it's an extraordinary site with huge potential, as Councillor Brown said. Um, for me, you know. The consultation has started, you know, preferably I would have liked to have seen a consultation probably stopped and go back to uh, looking at options appraisals with staff and, and working closer with staff and, and, and working out a, a real robust options appraisal and then go out to, for consultation again. Um, but, you know, that, that's, you know, that's for the officers and the, um, obviously the cabinet member to decide, um, you know, I'd love to see that provision remain, um, you know, not just for a Chepstow perspective, for, but for you know a county perspective. I think there's a huge amount more that we could do in terms of um, marketing the, the the potential and the services there, you know, beyond Wales uh, and crossing to the southwest. You know, there's an issue of subsidy. I understand that, but it seems to me that those uh, authorities that are sending their children outside of, uh, particularly outside of Wales, are not paying the full cost. You know, I, I don't understand why. You know, why, why is there a top slice for those, for those children com coming in? Um, so I think I'll leave my comments and observations there, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like um, to give uh, Mr. McLean a chance to respond and, th and then Councillor Eason after that. 
Thank you, Chair, again. Um, uh, so, a couple of points on those, Councillor Pavia. Um, with regards to staff's involvement, this whole process is around giving everybody a period of time to feed back to us. So I think that's really important. It was a clear process. That's how we determined that we wanted to take it forward. I think that the development of options which are contingent upon X or Y happening, upon X funding stream, upon Y number of pupils enrolling, actually makes that more difficult. So this is a clean process in my mind. Actually, we've taken this time. Everybody has full opportunity to comment, question, and add to that. At the end, everything is shared publicly. Our conclusions from that consultation exercise will be entirely transparent because you'll be able to read the things that come from the other authorities, the staff groups, and any other placing authorities and so on. And if we have unfairly represented them, then I have absolutely no doubt that as local members um, and members with a specific view, you will call in those decisions and you will question that in an appropriate way through the political process. So I'm quite content that the process we're undertaking is fair and does give that opportunity. <coughs> I was as surprised and disappointed as everybody when the £2 million rose to £6.4 million. Um, it's, work in, it's not work in progress, it's work that's been undertaken by MCC staff and I don't have any issue at all with sharing that and the working presumptions that sit beneath it in terms of how you plan for school places and so on. In terms of charging for additional support and so on, um, the... I'm aware of children accessing services at Mountain House. They do that through the auspices of the Pupil Referral Service. Um, when children transfer to the Pupil Referral Service, we do take the money from the schools who place them there. So the all poo, the or average weighted pupil unit does follow those children to help us afford those interventions. So we do do that. The out of county piece, Going, going back to this notion about tiers of need and support, I think it's really important that we recognise we are not a big county. We are a county of about 10,000 children in our schools at any one time. Our ability to provide these acute levels of support for those children who have the most acute levels of need is a significant challenge. I hope that the regional working that works so well in terms of praising standards and so on will actually help us address that in the fullness of time. And I know the work that my ALN colleagues are doing on a regional basis is certainly looking to that. My points around Mountain House and its historic place, um, I don't think are incongruent with our hope last time that it could be a key asset. My point was simply that it is in Monmouthshire by virtue of the fact that's where Gwent and preceding organisations developed opportunities. Clearly, from our consultation exercise last time, we recognise that it is an asset. We recognise that that space and the potential construct there is an asset. And it's really important that we take this feedback and if, you know, option three becomes the option with which um, county councillors on cabinet are able to coalesce, then as officers we will work to make that work for them and take that forward. In terms of marketing and so on, um, and this often comes to us from various places and different types of schools as to the type of marketing, my sense is, and Matt looks after our admissions and so on, we play a relatively straight bat, I think, in terms of promoting all of our schools. Um, we have a shared admissions panel for Mountain House, which works with the school and with officers from the local authority. And I think that's the appropriate thing, that that panel determines who should uh, start at the school and who shouldn't. So I think we've done the right thing in a very clear consultation exercise, and it will afford people the opportunity to talk to us, and it will afford us the opportunity to reflect on that wide range of views and feedback to the Cabinet. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Eason, and, and if I could please plead with members uh, to be as brief as possible, because we are getting near to the point now where you're going to have to elect uh, a new chair because uh, I haven't got that much longer that I can be with you. So if I could ask for brevity, uh, Councillor Eason. Thank you, Chair. Well, 99% of what I want to say has been said. But uh, going back a number of years, Mountain House is seen as a bad boys' school, and you were put there and dumped and, and forgotten about. 
but education has improved in the last number of years where it is quite clear there's a need for special educational uh, needs for these special educational youngsters and what we find in the trend across the across Britain is that there's an, an increased need for uh, additional learning needs for children so I, I would briefly say that we should be looking at an, a, a better model for Mountain House. I don't agree with you, Chair, what you're saying. Uh, we should have a better model for Mountain House, which encompasses both sexes, uh, maybe from 7 to 17 or whatever, because the, the facility is there, and I think the need is there. If you talk to some head teachers, they, if they're under pressure now to deal with additional learning needs within their own primary school environment, and of course, they don't have the resources to do it, which is clearly a result of a stage over the last 10 years where uh, everything's been cut back to the bone where now we're talking about closing Mountain House because we don't have the resources to fill it. Whereas if we created a model which addressed the needs of lots more children, and I, I do agree to a certain extent we don't want to farm them, uh, move them too far across the county, but I believe that we should be looking at a different model, improve what we got, because over the last number of years the school has turned itself around from being what it was to now into is the yellow category uh, it's moved up the cat categorical scale and i think there's a chance as an opportunity for improvement so i believe that we should be looking at option three not the one uh, and um ch change the model somewhat and look at both sexes and maybe d earlier and later in in uh, in any edu educational uh, program of life thank you chair okay, thank you Councillor. i think we've reached the point now where perhaps we should hear from the school itself so um over to you. I'd like to thank everyone, first of all. I, for sorry, could, could I just say the same rule that applied yeah, yeah, to parents? Five minutes. Yeah. I'd like to thank everyone for allowing us to visit today. Um, most of what we've heard is covering what I would be saying. You'd, you'd appreciate as a head of the school, I'm passionate about mm. the successful work that the staff do and the outcomes that we are now getting. Um, the key points for me are... In, this, in the consultation document, there are only two options, keep as we are or close. I'm encouraged by the third option that's being talked about this morning, and br as brief as I can be, if we change admission criteria, if we redesignate the, s the school in terms of age and gender, change the funding formula to better reflect the needs that we offer, and relook at capital costs, what could we achieve, be achieved with the two million, and develop a, also develop a business plan where we speak to our colleagues in social care as to how the school could be used in a different way, then I think we could be looking at a very different school in the future mm -hmm. that meets the needs of Monmouthshire pupils. I'm very well aware of the needs that my mainstream colleagues talk to me about, particularly at primary, and frustratingly at the moment, I can't help them. The successful outreach we are currently doing is independent of the PRS currently, and I know that's we'd like to expand that in the future. That was also part of the proposal last year, along with the change to be in a 32-place special school, and that's what myself and staff would like to see being considered in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Chair of Governors, have you anything to add to that? No, I think uh, the head teacher has said everything that needs to be said. And I would just echo perhaps the one point. The school has residential facilities, and yet I hear that social services are always looking for respite care. Mm. Perhaps education and, so and social services should be talking to each other. And uh, finally, um, thank you for waiting so long, the view of the NASUWT. Uh, very briefly, um, I started my teaching career at Mountain House. I taught girls and I taught people that had been there from the age of four. It has evolved over the last 20 years and I see no reason why it should not continue to evolve. Um, our main concern really is from the mainstream point of view, as has already been alluded to, we do not have access to a revolving door six-week PR view. It would be brilliant if some Mountain House would be able to provide that for us. We have had some experience of outreach from them, it would be a way that we need to look forward to going through. Our other concern really is the staff at the moment are in the middle of a consultation. They're not sure whether to jump, to stay. Mm. It, you have got a, a team of expertise there that really needs to be looked after. Um, there are, in the ALN review, there are roles going into secondary schools and they're not sure whether they should be applying to them or not. And this is a concern that, that holds us greatly because if they did move into these roles, what have we got 
at Mountain House if our expertise is being spread out. It would be perfect for us to have an alternate. We all are aware of the finances. If we could have an alternate um, um, change of provision and maybe a period of five to, to six years to give them a chance to get themselves on their feet. Mm -hmm. And I think pretty much everything else I wanted to say has been said. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to close the uh, discussion there uh, and in summary say that uh, we have heard strong support for option three. Uh, we have also heard a very strong case for the authorities' view that Mountain House, um, part of the mix, should be whether it should remain open at all. Uh, clearly things will evolve and important points have been made today that I hope officers will take on board and also our cabinet member. Uh, for example, making sure that the voice of all staff are heard, uh, that the possibility of the use of the expertise that is undoubtedly within Mountain House is not lost, whatever happens as we move forward. But looking as to whether we could, as a committee, come to um, a, an, an agreed viewpoint, I'm not sure that that has been the point of this morning's uh, agenda item. It has been our chance as members of this committee and interested people attending this committee to put forward views for consideration in that wider um, uh, viewpoint before an actual firm document is brought forward. So uh, in summing up, I think all I would say is that this committee needs the chance to see final proposals and to actually make comment on those final proposals, having all had the chance to express our individual views this morning. Uh, I hope that that can be an agenda item for a, a future uh, CYP select meeting. If not, then uh, I will say on behalf of every member of this committee, we have the chance of recalling it, and I think that we might well want to do that if that's the only way we can get it back in front of us. It will clearly be a major decision, and in that it is, in a sense, flying in the face of what we were saying about Mountain House only 12 months ago, and the importance of Mountain House then, I think we've got to square that circle. And that, I, I would say, is an integral part of uh, looking at the future of provision as we move forward. So, uh, on behalf of the committee, I will say that we would like to see this again as things firm up uh, and that we might then uh, be in a position to actually give a very fir a firmer view. Very quickly, Councillor Brown. Cur Chair, it's going to be important to see what the consultation responses are as well. Thank you. This is exactly why I think the process needs to run its course. Let's see what the executive uh, and senior officers are at that point proposing. Uh, and on our role as backbench scrutineers, we can reflect the views of the wider county council. Could I thank you all for your attendance this morning? As I said right at the start, a very short agenda, but a very long meeting. Uh, I think we have done some good work this morning. Thank you all very much indeed.